Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. We're in session. Mr. Lashley, you have the honors. Oh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for another wonderful day that you have created. And dear Lord, give us the strength and wisdom to do the business for the citizens of Alamance County. And dear Lord, we know that all things are possible through you. In your name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Somebody in the first or second row has a faster motor on pledge than others. <laughs> Okay. We need to amend the agenda before we vote on approval of the agenda. That is, we have a tactic uh, collector uh, that we need to appoint in an interim basis uh, with our tax uh, advisor having resigned. Uh, tax collector is required by the general statute the tax administrator position is not required by statute. So this will be an interim uh, position, uh, and we'll add that as the first item uh, after the consent agenda. So it'll be a new 6A. With the amendment, do we have a motion to uh, accept the amended agenda? So moved. A motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Public comments. Now, let me state in advance uh, you will be timed. You'll have three minutes. Uh, and uh, if you will state your name clearly and your address, and then all remarks from the podium. Anthony Pierce. Anthony, I just saw you at a meeting Thursday. Yep, just seen you not too long ago. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for your service. Uh, my name is Anthony Pierce. I'm over at 2009 Atlas over in Hall River. Uh, tonight, I'm coming to speak to you based on some information that I received concerning county sports. Um, I usually don't speak too much, but I stay in tune with what's going on. But this one kind of is a little, I'm a little passionate about um, because, for one, I'm a product of county sports. And if it's true, what we've heard is that there's uh, an appetite to cut county sports as we know it. Um, and so I wanted to speak on it because I really believe there's a disconnect between community and county leadership. Um, many may not realize it if you haven't played county sports or been involved in county sports, but county sports are the very connecting fabrics of any community. Um, and quite frankly, the coaches, the men and women that coach our youth, they're more than just coaches teaching us how to throw a football or hit a baseball. In many communities, they're actually teaching how kids how to build character, teaching them how to control their anger. They're becoming parental figures, and they're investing a lot of time and energy into our kids beyond playing the sports to make them to become a productive citizen. And I believe that if we decide that we want to cut out county sports, that we're doing a disservice to the community that we serve. I mean, I believe that uh, in any well-organized, governed society, it is important as you serve that you be in close contact with the community that you serve to make sure you're not doing anything that's detrimental to it. 
So I'm just speaking on the record just to say that I hope that this is a rumor and not what is going on. I am a product of county sports. My kids, I'm looking in the room, my daughters cheerleaded for the Jaguars and some of the other uh, teams. And my son is at practice right now. And so I have a direct connection with county sports and, and really think that we need to revisit that and reconsider um, if we're going to make any changes to our county sports in the county. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Roxanne May. Hello, um, I live in Burlington over near Hall River. Um, I'm just here to speak on uh, the football. I'm not sure what the rumors we are hearing are true, but I hope that they're not. And I just have a few things to say about it. Um, I just want to take a few minutes to speak on how the things that we're being told is that we're not going to have like traditional tackle football anymore. It's going to be like, I don't want to say sissified, but really that's what it is really going to be. Um, they have to to learn to win some and lose some and that life isn't just handed to you on a silver platter. You have to learn to fight hard for the things you want in life. That things aren't just handed to you like a participation trophy is. If things don't work out the first go around, you keep trying for them. Football teaches you these things. Sportsmanship, work together, family, um, how to work together as a team. Really just Pee Wee football is training kid, these kids for playing in middle school and high school and maybe beyond if they won't. But even if they decide it's not for them, they will still walk away with vulnerable life lessons. If we abolish tackle football for kids, it will relay and within years it will be non-existent altogether. As well as speaking on safety, each kid is trained properly um, to hit for their own safety and accidents do happen, but that's in every sport. We take concussion protocol very seriously. The helmets and pads are inspected and replaced as often as needed. If y'all take traditional tackle football away, you are taking away from so many kids that live and breathe tackle football. Football teaches you that you can use things you can use in a lot everyday life situations. Pushing through, never giving up, work hard for the things you want, know how to tackle. Uh, know how to handle letdowns and failures. We just ask that you don't take away traditional football. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, we thank you as well. By the way, county commissioners, pursuant to our policy, will likely comment on these issues at the end of our meeting. We are not allowed to address the issues during your presentation. Uh, so I'd encourage you to stick around. I uh, guarantee you there will be comments on this issue and corrections. Okay, the next list, uh, three of us have looked at this name. Evans is the last. Jason. And Jason. Jason. Jason, I think. Uh, I think it's maybe Jason. Jason Evans. Last name Evans. So I'm Ursula Evans. Maybe. It could be. Yeah, that's probably all right. No, it was the one before Jessica. I think somebody put my name down, but then I came in and put my name down. Do you wish to be heard? Yes. yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm the next one. I'm Jessica Evans. Okay. okay. Your hand rises as bad as mine. <laughs> Please come forward. Oh. Okay. My name is Jessica Evans. Um, I live at 3314 Saddle Club Road in Mebane. Over the past several months, I've heard that Alamance County Recreation Department wants to move away from competitive sports to a more all-inclusive platform. You speak of inclusion and playing sports your way, but doing so, you're now taking away from sports for others. Competitive sports are good for kids. It teaches them resilience, camaraderie, and how to handle wins and loss losses with grace. These kids come out here in 90 degree weather more or, or more, rain or shine, for six hours a week, a minimum of 70 hours overall practice time the entire season, and leave their blood, sweat, and tears on the field, figuratively and literally. And to find out that we will only have four regular season games and two playoff games the entire season, that equals nine hours playtime. Some of these kids have nowhere else to go for a release. Some kids need this to thrive in other social aspects of life. 
They come and put their heart and soul in every aspect of the game. They leave it all on the gridiron. You are making decisions to transition from competitive sports to a more non-competitive, more inclusive program. But what happens to these kids? These kids that need the outlet, the structure, the discipline that comes from being with other adults and kids. Are competitive sports hard? Yes. Are competitive sports for everyone? Absolutely not. But you choose to eliminate the programs because of the personal preferences and not considering the kids that you're affecting by doing so is unacceptable. You say that if the competitive sports are what you're looking for, then you find something elsewhere. Well, that's great, but where? I'm a single mom with three boys, and you're basically forcing us to play travel. And, at this, and that is not an option for so many families, which means my kids will miss out on sports that they love, sports that they look forward to, and friendships that they have built. I strongly urge you to reconsider your decision around competitive sports for our youth. I'm confident that moving away from these types of sports will only hinder our youth. Signed, a very concerned parent of three wild boys. <laughs> <laughs> and I have, did you want these? You did. You can hand them out. And I owe you an apology. Your handwriting, I can read, is the one that says something Evans above it. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if somebody wrote me in, but I wrote myself in. <laughs> well, I fully apologize. <laughs> Yeah, John, it's your handwriting. We can't read, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's probably mine, sir. Yeah. Is it, do you see Ursula Evans on your list? It is. I think that's what it could be. It could be. Are you so, are you the guilty party I'm for the guilty that? ones? Okay, Why? come on, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Is the other Evans kin to you? No. no. Okay. Then you don't have to apologize. <laughs> oh, no, my picture. Okay. I am Ursula Evans, and I live at 1506 Iron Drive in Mebane. So I um, was a little thrown by all of this, um, just not really sure where it came from or why. And I, I don't understand the reasoning behind it. We can do different things for all kids but I don't think you should take away what we already have established for these kids, and, and I'm talking about competitive sports. If you wanna do some sort of pickup game type of thing, I don't think that should replace what we're doing with competitive sports. Kids need that structure, they need that balance, they need that discipline. We, we don't need to just have something where, oh, well, I'll just drop them off tonight and they'll go play pickleball for a little while. And there's no structure to that. Mm -hmm. This is structure, this is discipline, this is, this is teaching them life lessons that they're gonna use all through their life. So we need to keep these type of programs in place and not look at taking them away. I can give you an example is my daughter is 28 but I also have a dog in this fight because my son is 11. Well, just turned 12, sorry. Haven't gotten used to 12 yet. But she played rec all the way through, then she went the travel route. Then she, you know, played competitively in college as well. I feel that that's good for some kids and not maybe so good for others. But the competition needs to be there, the competitive sports need to be there. We need to make sure that we still have an outlet for these children so that they can see that, hey, this is a taste of what real life is. And we give them a basis and a groundwork for when they get to high school, not just shocking them to death when they get to high school and they find out what competitive sports are really like. Yeah. So let's keep those building blocks that we have in place so that they can learn, and when they get to high school, they'll be ready. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know that a lot of commissioners are shaking their heads in a and affirmation as you speak. <laughs> but I'm not commenting yet. Jennifer Warren. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Warren, and my husband Brad and I live at 1353 Stonewall Springs Road here in Burlington. Um, we have been in the <laughs> The county rec since we were little, I'm not going to tell you how many years ago that was. Um, we come through with championship teams out of Mebane. We come through um, sports at the high school and middle school levels. Um, my husband went on Graham State Championship team. 
it's been a part of our whole life. And now we have a 13-year-old that's playing at Woodlawn, and we have an 11-year-old daughter who is playing football on the 12U team at Hallfields. I say all this because not only with football, but also baseball and softball that we've coached over the last nine years, um, it's been a huge part of our household. It's a healthy competition in our home <laughs> between both my kids playing uh, football and baseball and softball. We get out and play basketball. I say all this and also as an educator here in Alamance County that we need competition throughout our life. Um, whether we are trying out for a team, a seat in the band, a chorus spot, it doesn't matter. Competition is a part of our life. We're competing for that grade. In my classroom, like the highest grade level you get, the certificate at the end of the year to say the highest grade point average for the entire year. And it's a huge thing for the parents, a great sense of pride for the kids and the family. But now let's think about as an adult, you guys have competed for a position here at this table. It, we, this is an election year, it's a huge year for us. Um, we have it for a, a job in our careers. We have it for a project that we're looking for. We can't get rid of competition. It's a natural bred instinct in us. It is the, I'm a science teacher, so it's the essence of natural selection and then competitive versus um, being able to live together in cohesion and everything. I say this, please do not take away from these kids who get out there and are in the sweat of it all, in the cold of it all with the parents with their, their pods and the rain and stuff being out there for our kids. But there's a way to balance all of it. We can have pods for the kids that are just learning. And that's a great place for them to learn and a great outlet. But also the ones that want to keep and the families that want to keep that competitive nature. Because for my family, travel is not an option. And I do not want to take that away from the money I pay to Alamance County and the programs that we help provide there also. So thank you for your time. We thank you as well. Jennifer, it looks like McCallum. My name is Jennifer McGowan, and I am, I live in Burlington. Um, I am not only a sports mom, I'm also a coach's wife, and I've, for the last two years, been the associate director for Hallfields. Jaguars. Um, competitive sports mean a lot to these kids, um, especially our kids. We get a lot of kids who, this is the only time they get to be a kid. Um, they grow to love these coaches. We grow to love them. Um, if you take that away from them, I don't really know the consequences of that. It will literally probably take the only thing that some of these kids love. Um, our coaches do more than just coach them. They love these kids and they love them hard. Um, they go to other games for these kids. They become a part of their lives. F football has every year dwindled down, not participation wise. We've seen the highest numbers we've seen since COVID, but the county rec is lessening and lessening the amount that we get. We only have four games this season. Well, six or seven, if you count playoffs. Kids are just figuring out what works in four games. The coaches are just figuring out what works. They're spending more time learning the game than they are getting to show what they learned. And that's really sad. That's sad for the parents who put in time to bring them to practice. They pay the money for the cleats. They pay the money to register for them to play. And four games just, it isn't enough. Um, so I would strongly advise looking into that and seeing why we are constantly being cut. I know there are only four teams left, but you might want to ask why there are only four teams left. It's not participation. For Hallfields personally, we've seen our highest numbers. We have at minimum 30 on each team, all the way 8U, all the way to 12. There are 30 kids, and this is a competitive sport, and it's a tough sport, but they're out there every day for six hours a week. So 
I would just strongly advise you to maybe take some time and look into why they're not getting the amount of time that they deserve. Thank you. And we thank you as well. Sabrina Simmons. Ms. Simmons? Yeah, I'm, I really don't want to speak. I'm just a mother of some kids that play. Um, that's really, I'm just here just as being a supporter of competitive sports. I have three kids that play um, and that are involved in sports and have been for three years. Okay, not just much. a mother. You know, well, just, you know, <laughs> it's the best job in the world. <laughs> Thank you. you know. Henry Vines. <laughs> Anthony, had you boxed in? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioner. My name is Henry Vines, uh, 3450 Eyes Drive, Snow Camp. First of all, I'd just like to say um, all these folks here tonight have you know, given their comments. I've asked this before, and I'll ask again, so that y'all change y'all's answering time after these comments so these folks don't have to sit here for two, two and a half hours waiting on to hear what you got to say. But that's not the reason I'm here tonight. I'm here tonight uh, in concern over the red the resigning of Jeremy Aikens, our tax advocate. Um, I was completely shocked and surprised when I read in the Alamance News that Jeremy had, re had resigned. And I thought to myself, what in the world, you know? Why? I'm on the board of equalization. We work with this man, and I work with this uh, man for uh, eight months every week and we as the board of equalization didn't even get a notification that he had resigned we had to read it in the newspaper i just don't think that that should have happened if this is uh, not a policy that committees get notified by the person that are directly you know responsible for them then it should be because, like I said, for me to have to get this news out of the Alamance News is wrong. Uh, secondly, I would, I would like to say that I hope that you commissioners ask Jeremy not to resign because he does do a good job. He helped us tremendously knowing what this county is and knowing where it's at. And when we have these... Uh, people come in for appeals he knows the area we let a man walk out of here with a lot of knowledge in 16 years of knowledge I think that's what it was here 18 years, 18 years of knowledge that we really need it we're headed into a reval that's going to start January 1 and we have nobody at the helm I know I didn't know y'all were talking about interim so just now, but folks, we have we've lost a good man. I tell you, we have lost a good man, and I would like for you to reconsider maybe going and ask him would he reconsider his resignation. And if you don't want him to be at that town, then put him in uh, evaluations. His knowledge is valuable. Also. You know, I've heard all of you, you know, say how you've recommended him and how good he's been. A 99% collection rate is nothing to be sneezed at. I appreciate it. My time's gone. <laughs> and we thank you. Mike Pointer. Point, pointer? Pointer. Thank you. Um... <laughs> Hi, uh, my name's uh, Mike Pointer. Um, I'm a come out of Mebane, and I'm here about the the youth sports programs. Um, kind of came as a little bit of a shock, considering I first heard about this last week, and I've heard since then that this has been something that's been up in the air for multiple years now. Um, I personally, my stepson, he is lives 
breathes, eats football. And when I say eats football, he has his specific, specific football oatmeal that he eats every single time before a practice because that's what he knows that gives him his protein and everything that he needs. Um, I can't speak for a lot of the other kids and the other players. I know my situation. And my new situation knows that um, – I've put a football field on this boy's wall with a picture of Travis Kelsey because that's who he admires, right? Um, that's who he <laughs> admires. But the what I've seen with him, because he just started last year, and this is his second year, and the child that I saw last year compared to the child that I saw this year is completely different, right? He has so much more confidence. He has so much more self-esteem. He is so much more compassionate than he was with the players before. He has built friendships from people that are down in Florida to New York now, you know, that he constantly wants to call and have those relationships with. It has built so much character in him that it's not funny through these programs. I have my own son that's in baseball and the amount of confidence that he has shown just in the amount of time that he's been playing and the skills that these boys go out and every single every single time they come back and they have a mess up or they have a play that they got wrong, they come back and they go, I don't know what happened. I, this it, It's so frustrating for them. But then for them be, to be able to go out there with their coaches and go out there with me on the days where they don't have practice and we work on it and they get better, my boys have become goal-oriented to something outside of video games, to something outside of something that becomes easy to them. It's hard, it's meant to be hard, but it's meant to be hard for a purpose because it builds character. Character is literally the, the, the face of healthy adversity, right? And pickup games, or at least the ones that I participated in growing up, a lot of pickup games, some of them are great, some of them are really toxic. The people that you end up going up against are usually the ones that end up forming together and that's the team, they're the all-star team. And I'm short, you know, I've got a few pounds on me, right? I don't. I don't, <laughs> I don't jump as high as I used to, right? But the, these boys go out and they, they, they try their hardest. They build the character in healthy adversity. They, they build the character in these competitive sports. And that's what they need. If we go to something different than this, and I'm not saying that if it may be not needed, it may be a good idea for a beginner level, but for these kids that, that are six years old, that are eight years old, 10 years old, 12 years old, that want to continue to play football, baseball, whatever other contact or physical or competitive sport, that I like my boys know that they're gonna to wanna to continue to do this through high school and one of them has said he's already gonna become a professional and he's nine. So that's my time. It, this is my boy's heart. This is my family's heart. Please don't take away. Roy Shepard. <clears throat> she's in the annex, probably. Or yeah, here. I saw her. She's here. Yeah, she, I moved the elevator up with her. Lord, while we have a second, I know it's our policy not to comment until later. If all five agree, do you want to comment now, that is, after the last speaker, instead of doing it at the end of the meeting? I agree. I agree. I've asked Absolutely. about this before. Mr. Ashley, I agree. All right. So we're going to comment after the speakers. Uh, we're not changing our procedure, but on this one occasion, with the approval of all five members, we're going to do that. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So my name is Corey Shepard, and I reside in Mebane at 3363 Covington Trail. Um, I do want to say I have an 11-year-old who also plays football for Caulfields, and I support everything everyone said tonight, uh, but that's not why I'm here. Um, <laughs> so I'm here because I am deeply troubled by the recent Title IX policy, ABSS, passed last week. Um, I know this has nothing to do with you, your decision. You can't reverse the policy, but I just wanted to make everyone in leadership aware and the taxpayers what ABSS just did last week. Okay, so um, the policy that they rushed through means that biological girl could be disciplined for harassment or discrimination if she expresses discomfort or concern for her safety when a biological male enters a restroom or locker room. Uh, similar policies have resulted in girls being sexually assaulted in school restrooms. That's happened in Virginia. Um, she could also receive discipline for complaining about having to stay in a room with a biological boy overnight on a trip. That's happened here in North Carolina. 
The radical re uh, rewrite also impedes free speech. That means for students, teachers, staff, if they uh, don't use the correct pronoun for someone, they can face discipline action. So that sounds crazy, right? But it's going to get crazier because ABSS decided to rush this policy. Um, part of my job is to um, watch school board meetings. I do it school board meetings across the state. To my knowledge, ABSS is the only the second district to pass this policy. Wake County passed it a few weeks ago. Um, they had a lot of public comments, a lot of discussions, a lot of questions for the attorney. ABSS didn't have that last week. It was on the agenda as a discussion issue. They decided to waive the second reading and go ahead and just pass it. Not one concern about what this means for people, for girls, for students, for staff. And I really, quite honestly, don't even understand what they were thinking. Um, my assumption from what I've watched from them over the past year is someone told them they need to do something, so they did it. Um, they don't seem to have discernment. They don't ask questions. Um, my conclusion from what I've seen is that perhaps the county attorney that we have for ABSS, who actually lives in Wake County, maybe told them to go ahead and do it because he said, we don't have any schools involved in the lawsuit currently. Well, that's kind of true and kind of not. That judge in Kansas has ruled that even right now at this minute, people can sign up for one of the three nonprofits and become a plaintiff. Their school is automatically a plaintiff in this lawsuit. That list is not updated constantly. Um, he checked the list, but there could have been schools, uh, even when he gave them that advice, that made our schools plaintiffs and just not known yet. Those three nonprofits don't have the manpower to update that list minute by minute. So even the Kansas State Attorney General does not know the current list. And so we are in a bizarre situation because of what ABSS decided to do, which was rogue and radical. Thank you. And we thank you. Robin, is it winning ham, winning tone? Robin, first name. Wintering ham. Pass it again. Yeah. Wintrain ham. Wintrain ham. The okay. truck is not truck. <laughs> all right. Thank Good you. evening. It's nice to be here with you all. Um, I became aware of the situation about sports through friends, colleagues, neighbors, such such as that. I have to say that I'm well beyond this curve. My kids are 34 <laughs> and 31, but both of them were multi multi-sport athletes throughout their careers and had a chance to, in some cases, reduce what they paid for college from that. So I know the value of sports, and I have sat on many a bench up and down the East Coast. As I was thinking today about what I might say tonight, I thought, you know, I'm going to pick up the phone and I'm going to call my son, who's a Division I trainer. Um, works with athletes all the time. And I'm gonna ask if he can remember the first time he hit a home run. I was just curious. Chipper, can you remember the first time you hit a home run? Yeah, mom. We were down in the southern part of the county. We were playing on one of those short fields. I hit it over center field, but mom, we lost the game. <laughs> he said, we lost 11-10 in the bottom of the last inning. And then since he's a numbers guy, he said, I'll see if I can remember the field number, but since, I'm not, since it's not a number, I probably won't be able to do it for you. My daughter, likewise, was an athlete. She, she was a runner. I didn't get to reach her today. Um, she's a physician, and I couldn't contact her. But the reason I'm talking to you today is me personally. Well, for one, I went to an all-girls school, and we had to do sports, so that was non-negotiable. But... For my kids, they had a chance to meet more people, make more friends, see more opportunities, go more places. In fact, my son Chipper said, and mom, be sure to remind him about Pete Acosta. He was like the best. He told us not to go down to the swimming pool, swimming pool and play grab butt. He said, and mom, to this day, I, cannot I don't know what grab butt is, but I didn't do it. <laughs> But anyhow, the reason I share that with you is I was kind of testing my kids. That's a long time ago for them. And he remembers it like it was yesterday. It was kind of amazing to me. And it just made me hope 
that we can find a resolution here that will work for our county because I've seen what it did for my kids, the esteem it gave them, the confidence it gave them. Um, and I've seen that happen in so many of my friends' kids. And I would hate that we would lose that now here at this stage. Thank you all for listening. And one final thing, this comes from the grave. This is something my father gave me. He was quite the Garrison Keeler fan until Garrison made some mistakes. But it says, and this is true, and this hangs on my wall and I read it every day, nothing you do for kids is ever wasted. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And we thank you. These are all the public speakers. Ms. Thompson, uh, comments about the public speakers. I just thank you all. That's, that's how you get things solved is you come talk about it and you stand up for your kids because if you don't, nobody will sometimes. Um, I played softball from when I was walking, played for Southern, traveled, um, and my daughter played. She ran track and played soccer for Williams, and we traveled everywhere. I've never been so cold in my life at a soccer game. And, um, and you do, I mean, one year I said, Sophie, every goal you score, I'm going to turn a cartwheel. <laughs> Thought I was going to die. Four. So anyway, but you do what you say, and my oldest one ran track. So, But it's so much more than the, the sport. Uh, all my kids become friends with kids that have probably never crossed paths with based on academics, possibly. And um, it showed them how to be part of a team. And uh, that's missing a lot of times nowadays. And I know the sacrifice parents do, Lord, the gas money, the money, you find money, you go to grandparents and give me, you know, you just do whatever you can because this builds a kid from the inside out. And, um, and I think it's, it's like military. It's just one of a thing and, and kids need to be part of a team because sometimes um, all they have is at sports. I remember whenever we changed the policy at ABSS to a 2.5 grade point average and um, and it was, it was hard because I knew some kids went to school to play, and that's all that kept them there. But their coaches worked a lot with them and kept up with them to get their grade point average up because, you know, the Kansas City Chiefs aren't parked outside of Williams. You, you, I mean, you know, Travis, let's go. Oh, my God, I love him. But anyway, um, and Patrick. But um, I'm just saying, I, I'm just really glad you're here because, um, you know, I don't know if we, we all hear things at a different amount of time. And I, mean, I think probably this has been to add stuff. I don't know. We'll find out. I'm going to ask this bit on the agenda if we need to to talk about this because uh, Bill and I have both served on Parks and Rec, and you have too, John. And I don't think we're ever going to treat that with, <laughs> with the budgeting that it needs to be treated because I don't want one kid to ever not be able to play sports because they can't. You know, you see all the time about moms and dads going to bat for other kids. And I'm going to tell you, that coach, male or female, is sometimes the only parent that kid has. And they show them the way to walk this world. And if you're a kid nowadays, the crap coming at you, you need a support team around you. And if it's a football or whatever it is that you got to blow up or throw, I just watched the Olympics. I've never seen people run so fast in my life. They're like, I don't know what. But at the same sense, there were a lot of issues around it. And I just really want us to focus on kids and what they're doing and let them be kids. Because like I said, there's a lot um, going on around children nowadays and, and it's just really unfair. And uh, this is one thing that this county needs to stand by as its children because red ball builds school ball. School ball builds college ball and it goes on that way. And, um, and everybody needs a good, healthy, safe, after school place to go whatever that looks like and um, as county leaders and as Alamance County um, our parks and rec our parks are a real rock star for the state and we need to make sure our kids have a place to go to be safe and learn how to get along and you got to really everybody can win but you got to really learn how to lose because you will lose certain things as you're growing up and they will build you they are growing pains so um, I'm just thankful you guys are here. Thank you for standing up for your youngins. That's, that's all that matters in this world because they are our future. Mr. Lashley. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for speaking up tonight about, about this issue. Um, like the lady said, the last speaker, um, I played rec ball in the county and I lived in the city. And some of the folks that I, the camaraderie and the fellowship last to this day. We're still friends and we played in peewee football. Um, it's an, and like, the, like the parents said, it's really important for these kids to learn how to compete and how to lose and how to have 
uh, I think, conflict resolution. Because yeah. sometimes it doesn't work out too, for you too well, even on your own team. Um, but it's extremely important. I, I'm glad that you came and, and talked about this tonight because, like Pam said, it's, um, it's something that we, I'm glad that we, we know uh, for a fact. And another thing is, is uh, the, the Parks and Recs director was here tonight to hear all of it, which is a good thing as well. Uh, so I just want to thank you for your comments. Thank you for standing up for your kids. It is, it's extremely important. Um, I do thank you for that. Um, since it's the comments period, I don't know if it's just re regulated to this, this particular subject, but I wanted to uh, thank Corey Shepard for coming tonight to talk about something that's going on at ABSS that's extremely important to parents. Now, some of the parents who spoke tonight don't have kids in ABSS. But it's extremely important that we know what the school system is doing and how they're doing it and if they're following the rules. As we found out tonight, they jumped ahead. They didn't read, do a second reading, which is mandatory, to continue on with this Title IX stuff. And the only thing I'm going to say, and I'm going to be quiet, is I just wish that the school board and the school administrators would care so much about the scores of our students rather than all this peripheral stuff that doesn't mean that. Amen. Hit a bill, hill of beam. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, just want to thank the parents uh, and Corey Shepard for coming out tonight and making us aware of this of these issues. Um, I didn't find out that this that there was something that we had changed with the football schedule until Friday. Um, certainly, reducing the amount of competition is inconsistent with the policy this board has stated by um, by bringing five, I'm sorry, three fields in the county up to measure to be able to play ball at those fields. Um, I just have a question: When do the games start? September 9th. Is there time? to look at this policy by our next meeting to make a decision about whether we can change policy by the next meeting to affect these games. Yeah. Mr. Turner, we have the director here. Mm -hmm. uh, let's address that after our comments, please. Okay. I will wait. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Carter, and I want to thank Mr. Carter. He just had surgery, as you can see, this past, late last week. This week. This week and is here regardless. We won't pat you on the shoulder. No. What? We won't pat you on the shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> Not on this side anyway. Um, like you know, I did some coaching myself, and, and the, the mm -hmm. thought that come, came to my mind when we started talking about these kids was I was coaching soccer, and uh, I didn't know anything about soccer. I had to read up on it myself to figure out what I was doing. But I, it, uh, my first a couple of weeks on the field with these kids, I figured out that Charles Schultz really had it down. <laughs> it's a cloud of dust with feet and hands sticking out of it, and every once the ball shoots out when you're six years old. My son was playing then. He's 42 now, I think. My wife's looking at me, so she's not, so I'm right. So that's a long time ago, but, yeah, it, it was a lot of fun, and the kids grew a lot, learned a lot through it, and uh, was involved in sports myself as a youngster. So it's uh, it's something we need to take care of. Definitely, I support that. I coached girls soccer for 18 seasons. I coached girls softball for 10 consecutive years. Joyce and I, sitting on the front row, married 51 years, four children, seven grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren, all of whom played sport, or, play, or playing or have played. Uh, I coached guys soccer for 10 seasons. Uh, baseball, I'm gonna say eight, nine years. Uh, look at my wife, she's shaking her head. And church wide league basketball, three years. Uh, I played baseball through one year of college, 
and found out I was not nearly as good as I thought that I was. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of lessons learned with sports. Corey Shepard, I want to thank you for being here. She's a candidate for school board. Uh, and she pointed out not only that did ABSS rush through last week, not in a regular meeting, but in a work session, this change in their Title IX policy. Uh, they did not do the two readings. Uh, their attorney attended the meeting by telephone and told them that they should do it. And they just rushed through a vote to change their Title IX. And LMS News, by the way, you get a good article. Uh, nice say Supreme Court, guess what? Friday. Did away with a lot of these changes. And so the school board, I would hope and pray, would go back and have another meeting to undo the mistake they made last week. But I only have three daughters and one son, so I'm not partial, <laughs> as I laugh. Uh, sports are critical. Uh, the Title IX situation is critical. Uh, and we've got to pay attention to who we elect to the school board. Uh, and we county commissioners do not give any, have, we provide money to the school system, but we cannot tell the school system what to do. They have their own law firm out of, out of Raleigh, Wake County. Uh, and I've had two school board members tell me after what I thought were foolish, I'm trying to be nice, uh, decisions to say we didn't have a choice on those votes because the superintendent told us we had to do it. My response was, who's the elected official elected by the citizens of Alamance County and who's the hired guy? And I told both of those individuals, you're the elected official, you've got to step up to the plate and make the right decision. Don't just listen to what somebody tells you. And I think all five of us as county commissioners do that. We don't just take what somebody tells us mm -hmm. and act on uh, act upon it. Yeah, unfortunately, you'll see that probably tonight <laughs> as the meeting goes on. Uh, but I think what you guys have talked about is extremely important. I want us to have this opportunity now as opposed to making you wait until we'll have another county commissioner's comment period at the end of the meeting, but it hopefully won't cover this again. Uh, now, we do have the director for Recreation and Parks, and would you come forward, please? As she's approaching, I know your name, but tell everybody else, please. Hi, my name is Jamie Merkel, and I am the uh, Parks, uh, Parks Director for Alamance County. And doing a wonderful job, by the way. Um, all three of us commissioners on this end have served on the Recreation and Park Board, uh, and those were really good years. Um, and Bill, I guess you're on that board currently. Uh, we have one county commissioner on most boards uh, that uh, I have the privilege of assigning uh, after the election of a chairman each December. Uh, and we have always had a county commissioner on the Recreation and Parks Board. But I did not know until I was in a forum Thursday night uh, that this had been cut back to four games. So I had the audacity to call this lovely lady, uh, and she told me why. And if yeah. I can just, uh, the problem is there are all of these competing leagues now that are taking football teams <coughs> away from the county. So if you would explain that and expand, please. Sure, so I know um, in speaking with my staff for this year specifically, just to address this year to start, um, it is the same number of guaranteed games as last season. There is one less organization 
participating this year with Green Level moving their team to the CCYAL. But last season, there were five regular conference games where each team played each other once, followed by a single elimination playoff, and then the championship. So there was a guarantee of six games, five regular season, one playoff, and then if you made it to the championship, one in addition. Um, also, I know Hall Fields does a good job as well as Alamance Civitan with offering a preseason jamboree every year, which is uh, scrimmages between the teams that participate. It's also, I believe, a fundraiser for their programs for, to, to raise money for their football programs. Um, and then uh, each team has a bye week, and it is my understanding that they could schedule a non-conference game with a team that perhaps plays in one of these other leagues if they want to add an additional game to the season. And I think that's been the case in past years as well. Um, so as far as this season goes, my understanding is it's the same exact number of guaranteed games as last season. Yes, it's less regular conference games because there's one less participating organization. Now, in addition to Hawfields, um, Alamance Civitan, and Northern Alamance Athletic Club, we also, it's a collaborative league between Alamance Parks, the city of Mebane, and the city of Gibsonville. And so we have to, when you, when you mentioned if we can do anything about the schedule with the season starting September 9th, we have to take them into account because those two municipalities, their teams play in this league and it's a collaboration between the three parks and recs departments. So their basketball seasons start in November. So if we go too late into mid-November, or early December, they have to look at that and figure out if that is possible for them. <coughs> And I, my question to you on the phone was, could they each play each other twice? That, that that's yeah. The reason they that that was my understanding. The reason why it's not going to be an eight-game season plus playoffs and championship is because it runs too late into November, possibly early December. Additionally, I had the audacity to ask, why don't they agree the two cities? And your answer was, they don't have the staff. Yeah, yeah. Staffing-wise, <laughs> they can't juggle a basketball season with a with a football season at the same time is my understanding so i'm not trying to answer for all five commissioners i have no authority to do that but my thought and i'm thinking out loud no attorney should ever think out loud and i've been practicing <laughs> for over 50 years <laughs> uh, but one see if we can get some more teams to participate in the county league uh, and yeah, I don't know if that's possible or not. Uh, we, the county, would like to give more emphasis to recreation and parks uh, and you give the kids the opportunity. Uh, I learned a lot playing sports and I hopefully taught a lot with all the coaching I did. Uh, Tell you a quick little story. We had uh, President's Day at uh, Elon College football game. They were playing a team out of Connecticut, um, and they invited all of us county commissioners and mayors and whatever to the president's box to watch the game. Uh, we were up there in the president's box. I'm on the front row and watching the football game. And Elon won, by the way, so I enjoyed it. Uh, and at the end of the game, um, Mr. Sharp, who's the husband of uh, the mayor of Elon, walked up to where Jerry Tolley and I were seated. Uh, Jerry Tolley had two national championships in AI. Yeah, he's the big time football coach, right? But whatever. So this young man walked up to me, by young, I mean probably 40. <laughs> uh, walked up and said, hey, coach, and extended his hand and then shook my hand, not Jerry Tolley's. <laughs> the point being, you can make a difference and all you guys and gals that are participating in these sports and supporting sports in Alamance County are making a tremendous difference. Uh, and I thank you.
is it okay while I'm up here if I address the sure. the rumor of the elimination of football? Please. So that that is not the intent, nor was that ever the intent of of the restructuring of the collaborative football league this year. The county rec department, we took a look at our budget and the entire budget was going towards these three sports effectively. Tackle football, baseball, softball, and and basketball. And so I know there's a desire. You guys all mentioned you coach soccer. The county doesn't offer soccer. And there's other sports like flag football. Not everybody wants to play tackle football, so there could be flag football options. So we were creatively looking with our board and with our staff as a way of how can we use the budget that we do have to offer more and then address the concerns that we get. We do surveys after every season of sports that we have um, for like basketball and baseball. And so was looking at that, of how can we address those concerns about the travel time and uh, the locations where things are at. So this plan was put together and I would like to, well, I would like to invite my staff to come back maybe for a future meeting to present the plan for youth athletics, we're still going to offer basketball. We're still going to offer baseball, um, and we're, but also pepper in some of these other sports that people have asked for over the years in more of a, a trial period. We know basketball and baseball are always going to be the biggest, and we're going to plan for those to be the longest and offer the most um, programs for it. But they, they are right. It's not looking the traditional way the way it was when there was 19, 20 different clubs competing in the county. I, I've taken the time to go back over the last 20 years of participation and the different churches and other civic organizations like Hawfields and Alamance Civitan and Northern Al Alamance Athletic Club that are still going strong. The others haven't made it. And so you look, you look at that there was a time in the heyday, which I think most everybody was participating in, where county sports is where it was at. And I am not fortunate not to have grown up here, but I hear the stories. <laughs> and my kids are also a product of county sports. My son is at practice right now at Mebane for um, the Mebane Eagles. And my older son plays football in high school. So I, I understand the value. I'm a product of competitive sports. I played high school basketball, soccer, and baseball. I was a multi-sport athlete. So we also take into consideration that is the sport choice and the things that sports teach. We're, wi we're willing to talk, we're willing to look at this, we're willing to, to examine it, but what we want to do is come and present what our plan is, so maybe it's better understood, because it sounds like there's a lot of misinformation out there. And so if we could have the opportunity to come, kind of go over what our plan is, and then maybe go from there. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, when you say the three sports like ours really consumes your budget, tell me what that spends. Officials. Officials. It pays for officials. Okay. Because, <laughs> um, like Hawfield, since you guys are in abundance here tonight, they, with their football program, they're uniforming the kids. They're putting the, the equipment on the kids. In Hawfield's case, they're providing the field. So they're covering the bulk of that, and the county in the past has provided the staffing to put the schedules together, kind of get all of the different clubs and municipalities that are participating on one page and and um, provide the officials, and that cost has gone up and up and up. Okay, and up and up. So, so officials. All right, there was a time, and just say yes or no, when Todd Thorpe and I came to see you when I was on the Board of Ed about doing something within the schools right after school so the kids just wouldn't be sitting in the gym with after school programs, which that's whatever you choose to do. Has that took off or not? No, that required a staff position. We haven't been able to, to get done. Okay. <laughs> so I, I look at our budget and I see what our millions and millions of dollars seems to be a priority. And it, it's not, sometimes it's not about the positive. And you're going to have the negative when it comes to just what, what life is. Um, but that's um, when you're, all your money goes to officials that's not a lot of officials if you hadn't got all the thing because does our churches pulling back from sponsoring teams and parks and rec or is that city or both and so when it comes to sponsors yeah for football for example Hawfields is fielding the team so Hawfields is going out and getting the sponsors okay so 
or Alamance Civitans fielding the team. So they're going out and finding the sponsors. City of Medvin's fielding a team. Yeah, we're, we're, this year we changed it to a collaborative league where everybody is, sp we're spreading out the cost of officials, where the municipalities are covering the cost of their home games. We're asking the clubs to cover the cost of their home games. And then we are still, the county is still paying for the contract with the booking official um, and uh, the staff that have to be out at the ABSS facilities. The, I'm trying to remember it off the top of my head, sorry. Okay. The, uh, um, Awards at the end of the season, the footballs, things like that. Okay. I'm going to, going to say this. I think we have a priority problem. Okay. And um, that's just my opinion. But no, no, no. I just think that's my opinion because I know this guy here is big Parks and Rec. Rex and Park. I said it wrong every time. I know the TV show. And, and you too. <laughs> and uh, the water show. And, um, you know, we keep, we have all of these red flags around our children. We just keep having red flags around of our children. We have the opioid crisis. We have the gangs. We have juvenile crime, you know, and that's, and we just, are we going to have to be hit over that? I'm not fussing at you. I'm fussing at the flipping world I because we just keep getting these flags waved and I don't know why they show out at school. I don't know why they're selling weed. I don't know why they're doing this. I do because they're really not our priority. And if we don't start looking at that, like, you know, I heard of Supreme Court 4-3, you know, and I'm thinking and nowadays we just seem to go ahead and do things and then we get sued about it later in our big government. So um, we're a hot mess. And I don't want our kids to suffer at the consequences of some of the wherever us leaders are because we're so removed from reality. And I just really hope we can think about this because we... You know, our but we just raise people's taxes. We should have plenty of money. Right. You know, so I just and I appreciate everything you do because you probably felt like Frankenstein in the tower tonight. I'm right up there with you sometimes, and I just want the parents to know that you know when you have to pay for everything and you pay your taxes, that don't make sense to me. So I just want us to really look at stuff how we can look at this differently because I think the kids are getting the short end of the stick. If you don't put into them, you will find out later. You'll be putting into them right across the street. So, that, you know, I, I was, it's just frustrating. I know it is for you, too. So, can I say something? Uh, Mr. Turner. Uh, Sorry, Chris. I wonder if I might try to problem solve the question in the room, which is more games for the four county teams that yeah. exist. Mm -hmm. Could we not add one or two preseason games just for the county teams, let them play each other and... They do the jamborees, but you mean just full-on preseason yeah. games that wouldn't count towards? Yeah. This season, right now, more competition. I, I will bring that back to my staff and, and find out logistically what that would mean. Yeah, and could we do, or, or could we do a double season tournament? Double season, the double elimination tournament. So the way, they torn, the way the playoffs are working this year, there is a, I believe there's a play-in game, and then there's going to be a consolation game. So whoever doesn't make it to the championship, there will be consolation games in each bracket. That's what gets us up to the same number of guaranteed games as last that, season. That we look at the, particularly the preseason games for these teams that would get more competition this season for the folks in the game. I mean, I think that's something we could look at. We don't have time for preseason games. They don't have we time. We just start practice. Right. I'm, I'm a coach. I mean, we don't have time, but we do have time to play a home and away against each team. Because in the coaches' meeting, Mevin said basketball does not start in November. Right. If you count the weeks up between September 9th and November, we have more than eight weeks. There's enough time to play a home and away in each team. Let me suggest this. Uh, Mr. Turner, you talked about putting this back on our docket. I think that's an excellent idea. I'm going to ask you guys whether you're moms or coaches. And moms, by the way, can be coaches and are, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, get with Miss Merkel within the next week or so uh, and give her your ideas and then I would suggest that we put this on our second September meeting uh, and have you folks come back. Is, is that no agreeable with the board? It's too late. Late, late with the season starting. Yeah, this season oh, that starts won't September help next. this year. No, are you but it may help next year. I think you're so far into the season this year 
there's not much we can do, particularly with two municipalities. Uh, if they're going to be out mid-November yeah, because of the basketball and the other situation. So there's not much we can do for this season, but hopefully we can for seasons after this season. Would you guys and gals, I use the term gal, guys for everybody, having coached all of my daughters and, you know, but everybody's a guy to me. Uh, would you agree to do that and work with their staff? All right. I'm getting a lot of shaking of heads. Can we put this on our second September meeting? That's the pleasure of the board. We'd be happy to bring it back. All right. Thank you. Jamie, I got one last question yeah. for you. Does the county have to pay for insurance? No. For football? Yeah. No. The county carries insurance for the facilities okay. that we oversee the operation of, but the teams themselves have to carry insurance and um, have to do the inspections on the equipment. Okay, thank you. So, can I address? Yes, one? yes. Sir. So you talked about the county takes care of the facilities. It takes care of EM Holtz. It takes care of uh, AOs. Mm -hmm. Hall Fields is an independent facility. We mm -hmm. run our ball field. We pay for all our paint. We pay for our lights, water. That doesn't. The county doesn't pay anything to us for that, for maintaining that park. They do take care and maintain the other fields. So you're talking about pricing. We pay. I paid forty-seven hundred dollars this year for twenty helmets and twenty new pads. Every year, or every two years, all the helmets have to be recertified. So when you, I send all of them out to be recertified, I've got 100 helmets or 100 plus helmets. I'm talking over $5,000 to recertify my helmets. Yeah. I, this, I, I, this year my insurance cost $1,500 yeah, just I'd for ask, my kids. I'd ask that you discuss that with Ms. Merkel and let's bring that up in the, uh, the later meeting. I just meeting. want you all to be aware of what Absolutely. it costs an independent club such as Hallfields to play. Right. Um, yeah, we put up, we asked for a price on what it would cost to start like a football game or a football team from scratch for the age groups that everybody provides. And it was about $14,000, I think, in equipment, I but believe, to start from scratch. Please this lady, telephone her. Uh, she does answer her telephone, I guarantee, because I called her. <laughs> uh, and she did take my call and even call me back later. Uh, so I really uh, request, but here we are an hour and 15, 20 minutes into our meeting, and we have not got to the consent agenda, which is why we don't typically comment at the front end of the meeting. But I really think this is vitally important and would really encourage you guys and gals to meet with this lady and come back roughly in four weeks, and we'll see what we can do beyond this. Thank you very much. Thank you, right. Thank you for your Thank time. You. We're going to take a three and a half minute break so you guys can leave if you wish. We're back in session. Okay, we are down to the consent agenda. Do we have a motion as to the consent agenda? Motion to approve. Yeah. A motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Consent agenda is approved. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this time I'd like to move to uh, switch 686D to cover this courthouse space needs for, uh, prior to the resolution. And I will second that motion. Any discussion as to that motion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we are now 6B, courthouse space and needs. Can I, can I, I just clarify? We were do this. Oh, I'm sorry. I am so sorry. You had adjusted the agenda we're, for a 6A as tax collector. Correct. I apologize. That's okay. Oh, well, we need to modify your motion. Okay. Mr. Stevens, I think we have two motions okay. that we need to make. Is that correct? 
Yep, that's right. Uh, Miss Miller, everything I just said to you, just disregard and come on up to the podium, please. <laughs> Um, I, was, I was trying to get us through the agenda. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate yeah, your too. time this evening, board. Uh, just need to do a couple of things related to our tax process, related to Mr. Aiken's departure uh, last Friday. And we need to appoint someone to be your tax collector because taxes are due September 1st. So we need to do that before that process happens. Um, if you look at the packet in front of you, I've got a couple of proposed motions there as well as some tabbed items. Uh, the first tabbed item for your attention is in green. That is the, the bond that we actually received just today for Ms. Miller. It's a $50,000 bond that's required of her by statute. We obtained that today. It's the same amount that we had for Mr. Akins when he performed that function of tax collector as part of his job as your tax administrator. Just to clarify, there's actually two state offices that your tax administrator holds, the Office of Tax Collector and Tax Assessor. And to be clear for tonight, we're only going to be appointing Ms. Miller or asking for you to appoint Ms. Miller as your tax collector because the tax bill uh, becomes due September 1st. So um, the next thing I would ask of you as a board is to consider uh, accepting Ms. Miller's bond and appointing her as your tax collector under GS 105-349. Um, if you'd like to consider doing that, there's a proposed motion in front of you. And I will make that motion. Second. Okay. Any uh, further discussion on that motion? No. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Your bond is approved. Thank you. Continue. Thank please. you, board. Uh, the next part of the process is to order the collection of taxes for the 2024-25 year. Um, the tab in blue in front of you, you'll see, is the order for the tax collection. Um, and this allows us to collect taxes beginning September 1st and orders that they be collected. The next item is the charge off of, charge off of 2014 property taxes. This allows for us to charge off the taxes that at uh, August 31st will be barred from collection based on the 10 year statute of limitations in uh, GS 105-378A. So I'd like for the board to consider that. And the final item in front of you is the tabbed item that is the monthly report that you receive for charge off of, make sure I've got this correct. The July tax. I'm sorry? The July releases and refunds. I'm sorry, yes, thank you. The August, July, and I'm sorry, the July and August releases that you normally see, the monthly releases that you see is the next item in front of you. So what we need from you is for you to approve the order of collection, the write-off of taxes, and the monthly uh, exemptions that you see in front of you. And that's in item number two, proposed motions in front of you. I'll make that motion. Okay. Second. Yeah, motion second. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you, board. I don't know if Ms. Miller wants to be heard by the board at this point. Yeah, Happy to have her. Thank you words. for the opportunity. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And that's all for those items. I'm sorry for the the tabbed items, but that's all we had for that. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thank you. And I apologize. That was not on our normal agenda. We did the event. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 6B, courthouse space, needs discussion. Good evening, commissioners. Um, our goal for tonight is to revisit the discussion we began uh, two weeks ago about meeting the court system's need for additional space. So two weeks ago, we made some decisions around the need for immediate space. Uh, beginning this month and ma made uh, that call to allow them to use this room um, but we left unanswered the short-term needs and the long-term needs of the court system uh, I'd like to move forward with those tonight I'm we, we would normally go in order and do short term uh, but I'm hearing that there's been a lot of discussion and some momentum around uh, the long-term issue so we'll skip to that first and just discuss our, our long-term needs and our options in front of us. Um, you'll see highlighted there the requirements that we discussed at the last meeting, um, which we identified five years ago in our, our space plan, identified needs for additional courtrooms. 
um, we have been through three iterations of courtroom design, and this is um, our latest and our most practical uh, from an expense perspective. Um, so I'll just walk you through what this design looks like. Um, it is an additional building on the west side of the courthouse, so it'll be on the right if you're looking at the courthouse. Um, we have an option of two or three stories. Um, this would be the first floor, and this large block would be all office space. We have not specified the use or how that would be broken up. At this point, we have made really conceptual plans to help us get a dollar figure and a square footage number for you guys to consider. We really haven't gone through the process of apportioning that space, so there's a lot of time to make decisions about offices and doorways and entranceways, and we'll, we'll get, get to all that, but the first floor is dedicated to office space. Um, the second floor would be for courtrooms. Uh, two courtrooms on the second floor, and if we proceed with the third floor, it will look exactly the same as that, so two additional courtrooms. Um, four courtrooms would meet the requirements set forth in the study uh, and give us space for several years, um, along with the 9,000 square feet of additional office space. Um, this would allow most of the courtrooms to be consolidated in one location. I had some discussion with um, the judges about whether they could get them all over there and needed to retain some here. So that's possible, but it, it moves a lot of the court into one location, um, which is a need that they have for being so spread out. Um, and it would allow the county to take over some of the space in the civil court building as we originally planned. Again, probably not the whole thing. We'll have to walk through uh, which floors they can get out of, which space they don't need anymore, but it would allow the county to have some of that space when the new addition is done. So the numbers that we've uh, worked with the architect to come up with are 28 million for a two-story addition, 37 million for a three-story addition, and it's been a really long time since we priced out what renovation costs would be for the civil courts building we don't know how much space we're talking about, when that would ever happen. So I haven't put a price here. Just to know there's some cost associated with that when we get to that spot, but it's several years away, so. You're saying civil court is this? So this is county office building. The I attached know. second building That's is, the, is civil, civil courts, court. yeah. Okay. So if courts were able to move out of one or two floors over there, give those back to the county, we'd need to do something to make them not courtrooms anymore, make them suitable for county use. Not a huge cost, but there's money there. I just want to be transparent about it. We don't, don't have those figures today. Can I ask a question? Judge Overby, yes, you, made, sorry. <laughs> you made a great point when you were here last time, talking about moving everything over there. We just basically get one additional courtroom. And, and the way it goes, that we're going to outgrow that in no time. It's just what happens. Um, I, I'm, I'm concerned about taking the three courtrooms, one, two, three, courtrooms here and turning them into office space for more government in this building when we may have to have those courtrooms when whatever happens. Then what are we going to do? So I'm just thinking if we're just doing all this move for one additional room, we're just rearranging furniture. And I, I'm just, I'm just not bought into that. I don't think anybody's talked about vacating these three core rooms in this building until we do the addition. Is that correct? Uh, at least until we've done the addition. And, uh, you know, I kind of mentioned it because that was the original plan. When we get the addition built and we meet with the court system, if they're utilizing those courtrooms, you know, we will have to adjust. The original plan was build them a new building. The county takes over the civil courts building. Um, we're not building a building of the scale that we had originally planned. So those, those things may change, and we just haven't made those decisions or had those discussions yet, quite frankly. Is that... Dresser. Yeah, what he just said has come right back down to the fact that you're only getting one additional for your new judge, and that's it. When it comes to courtrooms, if you're moving, getting rid of these three and relocating them. If you do the two-story addition, that I think that's correct. If you do the three-story, I think that is not correct. Is three story under the unknown, or do we? I see no, that right there. No, it's 37. Okay. But what I'm seeing is you got four courtrooms, but you're moving 
You're losing. Um, you're losing the civil three. court. Right. You're losing the civil court. And potentially. Yeah, and you're going to have well. If you're going to take up all this space and all that parking, you need to have a lot of courtrooms because if the rate crime's going, you'll have them full. So, sorry, Craig. Yeah. Um, two things. First of all, both of those numbers include uh, two million dollars for the JBL renovation. They do include a renovation of JBL. So the new the new addition is whichever one you choose. The new addition piece costs $10 million minus that. If you do two stories, the new addition costs $18 million and the JBL renovation costs mm -hmm. that. That $10 million figure is one that I don't remember. You're asking me because you know the answer, so I'll agree with you, but I, I know that the <laughs> renovation is included. I am asking yeah. <laughs> could you. Could you go to the diagram? Sure. Um, so you see there at the upper right, the hearing room, um, that's currently DA space, but you also have an opportunity to double the DA space by using the other floor for DA as well. That's an additional courtroom. If you assume that you keep all three courtrooms here, you're actually adding three courtrooms to, J to the JBL uh, complex. If you reduce the courtrooms here in this building, then you correspondingly reduce the number of total courtrooms. But keeping courtrooms here as three Courtrooms to that point. If you build so, so you are, if you build three stories, you're adding four total courtrooms on the new addition. But you will have already added a new courtroom for, presumably, for, um, well, we talked about the short term plan. Uh, that would add an additional courtroom for the first. Um, so you would, you would add a total of three additional courtrooms, presuming. You have Unless you vacate all the courtrooms here and then you're adding up. So it just depends. So I'm happy to answer any questions about the plan, about the process that we've gone through, but that's really all the all that I have as far as the presentation for the new courtroom building. As I understand it, we have $10 million already set aside for this expansion. So either the 38 or the um, 20, whatever it is, 28 and the 37, um, you can take $10 million right off the top of that. We already have it in our hands. Uh, so Ms. Evans or Ms. York, Talk to us about how we would pay for the extra 18 or 27. We would recommend that you would borrow the funding for the remaining balance of the courthouse. It's such a large price tag and you're going to have issuance costs. It makes sense to do the entire project in a financing with the addition of your 10 million revenue replacement that you had set aside that you'd pledged for this project, the remaining balance we would recommend of financing of that. There are other sources you could contribute. We've talked about you know, adding some capital reserve funds for this, but we think that the cleanest option is to fund the entire project minus the 10 million revenue replacement. All right, if we go for the three-story, mm -hmm. and I personally think we're making a gigantic mistake looking at a two-story addition. Uh, we need to look more to the future and not. We opened the J.B. Allen Courthouse under a court order, by the way. It was obsolete when it opened its doors. It was too small. Uh, I don't want us to make and I know we're talking about a lot of money, but I don't want us to make that same mistake again. Uh, Chairman so, Paisley, can I ask you a question? What you just said is a profound statement. When you built it, or not you, but when it was built, me. it was already too small. That's so who made talking. that kind of decision to do that? The county commissioners at that time. They were under a court order, ordered, in fact, held in contempt of court 
if they did not do additional court space. But they built it too small. I hate to say day because so. that was just the time of who was in the They leadership. did. I, I mean, that's I'm what talking you're saying. about past commissioners. I don't want to talk about him. Like I'm just saying it. the decision was when it was built, it was too small. I think they made two mistakes. And one, it was too small. Sheriff Johnson, am I right or wrong? <laughs> it was built too small. Thank you. Uh, additionally, they took only lowest beds, which turned out to be another mistake. Uh, and we are continually doing repairs that should not have happened had they taken the best bid, not necessarily the lowest bid. Not to mention a spring. Right, and it's, it's right. But that would have been financing, tax, any, it's what you do. It seems like we always want to take the lower cost to save money and we get burnt later. Well, you know. in a lot of cases, in some cases, that's yeah. some cases, we want to spend as little as possible. And I'm, at, I'm the guy that in 2014 got us a penny tax reduction. 2020, 2021 got a penny tax reduction and voted against the 23 and 24 tax increases. Uh, yeah, I try to save the taxpayers money, but at the same time, you've got to be smart enough, in my opinion, to sometimes you've got to spend money. Yeah, well, making a motion about a tax increase and it passing doesn't mean you don't make a motion to raise taxes. It's just when it's raised up higher by other commissioners and it passes, that's when it's kind of solid. And I'm hearing you and I'm, and I'm we just heard, and I know this is two totally different apples and oranges, but we just heard where a community has to buy all of their football stuff and their helmets and they pay the light bill and they buy their uniforms. That's what I was talking about a while ago. We just heard that. You know, and I just, it's, it's just really frustrating. I know that's, that's just what it is, but, you know, I, I mean, it's just, we just must have this pot of gold that never runs out, because that's what it seems like. I think COVID showed us that's not the case. Well, that COVID fairy's dead. She don't fly no more, and this is reality. And um, I, I don't know, it's just, I just, just ignore me, go ahead. <laughs> Now, I want to hear from everyone. Uh, Mr. Uh, a couple of questions for finance. If, if we were to uh, uh, build a three-story option, uh, put $10 million into, into that cash, what does the financing look like? And is any additional revenue required from the county? So we would be able to then finance roughly $27 million um, using the $10 million from revenue replacement funds. And early estimates would estimate that that would require a tax increase of 1.09 cents. Um, when? Um, when taking into account the planning period, the architect getting all the designs, probably would be about 18 to 24 months from now. Is that a 15-year term? That would be a 20-year 20 20 term. 20-year term. Yes, sir. So basically in two years, in two budget cycles, that would require at that time a 1.9 cents. There's what, $14.8 million in capital reserves now? Roughly, yes, sir. When we initially looked at the financing for, for this project at the retreat in February, we talked about an additional county contribution of cash of $5 million from the capital reserves. If we were to put $5 million in cash down, since they have down payment, leaving about $10 million in capital reserves, how does that change the financing fee? So that would then uh, reduce the tax increase that would be required, and then we would be estimating it at 0 0.89 cents, so less than one penny. And so that's either, it's either a tax increase, it's, it's additional revenue. Mm -hmm. So whether we grow into that or whether it's a property tax increase or sales tax increase, it's additional revenue somehow. That's correct. Or whether you take money from something else and budget it towards that. That's correct. How soon would we, if we do a 20 year term note, how soon would that tax increase be incurred? 
So I think the best way that we could manage that cash flow would be to spend down the $10 million first um, and use that for our architect fees, design work, things of that nature. That would give us time to have firm uh, bids in hand of what the construction cost would be, pay what we need to on that, and then work with the bank for placement. So would it be, uh, we're in currently 24-25. Would it be 25, 26, 26, 27? What year would the tax increase? Normally, for everything to work out, is about a two-year process. Would you agree with that, Mr. Baker? Uh, we could get through the design maybe a little less than two years, but by the time we started needing to pay, it's pretty close. Yeah. yeah. So roughly two years, you would be looking at fiscal year 27, so two years from now. So there'd be no tax increase incurred obviously this year, none next year the would be year. A, roughly a penny the next year. That's correct. A couple other questions. Why would you not recommend putting more cash down on them to the purpose, therefore reducing the amount of additional revenue required in the So by not putting more down, what that allows the county to do is to maintain a capital reserve in the event that another property comes available that we would want to purchase, or if there was an issue with an HVAC or a roof, then we would have those reserves to pay for that instead of having to go directly to the general fund and using unassigned fund balance there. And in the next item, we're going to talk about ARPA fund allocation. Is it possible to, to use additional ARPA funds in addition to the $10 million revenue replacement monies towards this project? No. Um, due to the regulations from U.S. Treasury, the project of the courthouse does not align with U.S. Treasury um, guidance for how those art funds need to be spent. So it would not be the best option of funding. It would be, be a wrong option. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Turner. We know to be concerned when Bill has his pen out. Yeah, if I was Mr. Turner, you'd be talking to that gentleman. I'm sorry. I'm Mr. Turner. <laughs> uh, well, uh, actually, to be honest with you, much uh, to the surprise of Mr. Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. It happens. You get you get your head down. Uh, but C Craig brushed over some of the topics that I was going to uh, talk to you about. Um, I was looking at a time when you would want to get started, um, and uh, the five million down. That's, uh, so I don't think I really have anything to add here. Um, I guess the only question I have is being a, a assumed to be Alamance County taxpayer and not a commissioner. <laughs> well, when, when can we expect to get started? Now, wait a minute. He pays taxes already. <laughs> <laughs> When do we think hey, we, we can get to dodge started? that bill? You know that, right? That? <laughs> so we don't get to dodge that. I know. I know. So I would have to defer to Mr. Baker to know the timeline of bids in hand and architectural. But we could use the ten million dollars to get to get started. To get started, yes. yes. And then we can finance it as we get close. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. And one precautionary motion that we could have the board to approve would be a resolution. Um, like we did with our emergency radios of a reimbursement resolution so that if we were to have to incur additional cost, meaning cash flow, gotcha. still within the, the projected cost, but if right. we're having to spend county dollars before we have the proceeds from the installment funding in hand, we would then reimburse ourselves for those expenditures. That and it's just a cash flow transaction. We are not, would not be increasing the cost of the project. It's a cash flow only. It would save some interest on the finance. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, have, have you looked at the percentage of, I mean, I know this is two years away, and you've got to make some assumptions that the Federal Reserve is going to decrease rates right. in the next six months? So what well, the um, projections that we're using right now are based with in line kind of with current uh, interest rates of about 5%. So once the Feds do start taking action, which is projected maybe later in the year toward December, that they would start dropping that rate, as those rates would drop, we would see a decrease in the amount that would be needed for that repayment of the debt service, and that, in a sense, effect is going to affect the amount that we would need for a tax increase. And there's a couple other things that are batting around out there, too. It's like uh, Bucky's will be probably online in, in two years. 
And I know a lot of people are in, looking forward to that, not only just for a great place to, to shop, but it could be uh, added revenues to the county because I do believe that other people from, um, on the, you know, like uh, Orange County and other counties are going to uh, be coming in that normally wouldn't have come in. So that, that could be, but hey, we don't know that yet, but that's something to look forward to. Did you see where Keith Irwin had a concert at a Bucky's? Not surprising. I saw it at the paper. <laughs> I don't know why he's getting gas, pulled out his guitar and went at it, but I thought, you just never know. Have we run this through the Davenport Mall again? So this is, in essence, separate from the Davenport model. Because what happens when we can run any project through the Davenport model, but what the Davenport model does is it assumes that we are going to use everything in capital reserves for our debt financing. So you end up getting to where everything in capital reserves are used for debt and it doesn't allow the county to expand for new projects that may come along in the future or if an additional building were to come available or if there were an immediate need that we would have. When we, when I talked to you earlier this week, I brought up an issue of the uh, art item in the uh, Times News. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember now. Obviously, this week has been a little fuzzy a couple of days, um, but there was that there was stated in the article that there was a 271 point, I believe it was three million dollar um, amount of funds being spent in Alamance County by people passing through Alamance County. That was 22, uh, and that was a pretty good amount of money. Have we looked? I asked you to take a look to see if we could figure out about what proportion that is of the total sales, uh, retail sales and travel and tourism sales in the county. So I have not had a chance to um, dig into that yet. I wasn't able to access that article. So I've gotten with Tori today and I'll be able to get that article from her and then I can okay. do an evaluation on it. I'm just curious to see what impact that would have on financing options. What did the article come from? It was in the uh, Times News. I think it was, I think it was Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So was it a local reporter? Was it any yeah. kind of It was a state, yeah. it was from state uh, state statistics, but it was in the local Times News. I'm sure just to look for it. A couple of years Mr. Chairman, uh, just so we're covering all the bases here, if we went with a two-story option, assuming the ten million dollars in revenue replacement plus the five million dollars in capital reserve spending, mm -hmm. what is the um, what's the revenue requirement for that? I do not have that number with me right now, um, but that would be roughly thirteen million. Do some quick math here. About five million dollars reduces your tax rate increase by zero one nine five cents. Reduces. Reduces. So it would be you would need the same you would need additional revenue. So with the two story option you would need additional revenue totaling point seven cents. So that would be about thirteen million dollars. So right now eighteen million is point seven cents. So roughly twenty cents off that, a half a cent. So half a penny. So half a penny to get a two-story option. To get point two nine eight point eight nine cents to get a three-story option. Um, and just so, just for for understand the dollar figure. Mm -hmm. Point eight nine cents right now is about two point three million dollars. That's correct. So we would need two point three million dollars somehow in two years. Mm -hmm. in, in revenue for this month. Right. And, and continuing that amount of money for 20, for 20 years. years. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Any other comments or questions for county commissioners? I'm going to make a motion at this point that we do the three story addition. 
to the J.B. Allen complex. If I don't have a second, I don't. Uh, are you including a funding method for that? <clears throat> Well, we have $10 million. I'm, I'm not including funding at this point simply because I don't think we have all the numbers yet to do it. But I think we need to move on giving county <coughs> commissioners guidance on what we're looking at. I'll second Thank you. Any other discussion about that motion? All in favor, signify uh, by... Mr. Chairman, I, I'm, oh, I'm, sorry, I thought... <laughs> I'm yeah. a little slow on the uptake perhaps tonight. I don't know. Um, I'm inclined to agree that the three-story option sounds like it makes more sense. I mean, everybody, we've, we've talked about our growth rate in Alabama County too many times already. And the projected growth is pretty phenomenal. And we're continuing to beat out quite a few other counties and Ms. Thompson and I were just at a North Carolina Association of County Commissioners meeting and got their latest maps book and uh, we're we're growing at a phenomenal rate. Um, um, the question I've got is of course how we're going to pay for it and uh, do the least impact on our services. I'm not sure we can endorse one until we have enough solid a solid um, understanding of how we're going to pay for it and, and be able to put the two together. Do you have a suggestion on the finances? Um, I, I need more information. I got this uh, earlier this week and needless to say I wasn't in a, in a position to get into all the details earlier this week. and. Uh, Feel like I have some questions. I'd like to find out some more information. But uh. well, we do know, and I'm, this is a question, a verification possibly, that we would have no tax increase this year. Obviously, we would have no tax increase next year, and we would have less than a penny tax increase the following year for a 20-year term. Based on current projections, yes, sir. Right. How do you know you're not going to have a tax increase right. next year or some kind of bottom Oh, we don't. Right. I'm talking about this item only. Okay. And that, this item only. That does make the assumption that you're using your revenue replacement and some capital reserve in order to get to that place where it's less than a penny. Yeah, Ms. Thompson's correct. I don't have a looking glass. I wish you did. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm talking about this item only. I don't think our taxpayers are going to be that upset if we're able to, if people talk about the court system, uh, we have our clerk of court, our uh, resident superior court judge, and uh, chief district court judge, and other judges here today, and they know we're using every <coughs> We're busting at the seams, uh, and we've got to do something. Meredith, you don't want any more room, do you? <laughs> She's laughing. Uh, and we, yeah, for less than a penny, I, I, well, Henry, I heard your comment. That's not what our personnel are telling us. 1.9 if you don't use the 5D. 1.09. One point, one point oh nine. Point it's, it's not two pennies. It's one point zero nine. So it's more than a, it's more than a, a penny, but it's not one point nine. Well, we've had several discussions about options of it. The last one was point eight nine. Maybe not a lot correct. Yes, five million. Right, using five million. Okay. You know, having gone through several iterations with the Public Safety Training Center, serving on the board of trustees of the college. We saw that go from 12 to over 20. That was years I know. waiting. I know. years waiting. Uh, you're looking at two to three years out. We don't know. I, I don't know how confident we can be about 37 or 28, but we don't know. But I but do know, this. Mr. Carter, if we continue to wait, it's oh, going to go up and not down. 
And the longer we delay this decision, the more it's going to cost us. Sure. That's why I want to figure out exactly how we're going to pay for it. Uh, a couple of comments, and then uh, I might ask you to consider a minute question. But um, I mean, we are we are busting at the seams. Uh, I know clerk space is uh, is a premium right now. There are clerk sharing spaces um, right now. We're trying to have a sh figure out how to place a court for small claims court. And one of the reason we're talking about long term and not short term is because it's very difficult to decide. To do that. We can't figure out how to create one courtroom right now in our current space allocations, uh, which just proves that we're that we don't have adequate spaces to do the court. The court um, to satisfy the court needs. It's true that there are seven judges. But there's also magistrates who run small claims court at the same time judges are running court and there's a, a clerk of court who runs hearings every day as well. So it's more than just seven hearing officers. Uh, there's nine. Uh, and you got to have courtrooms for all of those people at the same time. And I know that there are courtrooms that may be available in the afternoon, um, but you, 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 late in the afternoon, but if you, schedule, if you docket cases at a specific time, you don't know when those cases are going to end necessarily. You can't double book a courtroom with hearing officers. So these are courtrooms that are, that are needed. And that's not even taking into account whether we continue to grow the number of district court judges beyond five or the number of superior court judges beyond two. As the county continues to grow in the next, certainly in the next decade, those are going to be things that the General Assembly is going to be considering for us. And if we haven't planned for that, we're going to be in the same position that we've been in as we, when we created JBM. So this is a reasonable response to the requests that are needed. It has a modest amount of room for growth. Uh, I think it, it is a reasonable request and something that we've been putting down the road for two years. Um, I don't like having to spend additional revenue, but I don't see much of a, of a, of a way out of that. It's possible to grow into that uh, revenue replacement. We don't know. Uh, and worst case, at a 5% um, interest rate, which probably will be less than two years, it would require the 28 cents. I think it makes sense to put $5 million <coughs> of reserves into this to buy down some of the debt. I think it's a responsible uh, way to leave significant monies of $10 million still in the capital reserves. And so I think all in all, this is the approach that we ought to go with. That having said, I would ask the chairman if he would amend his motion to include financing, I'm sorry, to include uh, payment for this, which is $10 million in revenue replacement, $5 million in capital reserves, and the balance of the um, $37 million to be paid in financing. That's why I was asking. With a 20 year term. Yeah. I will amend my motion to that effect. Do you amend your second? I do. That's why I was asking for Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor of this motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Me. Was that a no? I said no. <laughs> Okay, it's four to one passes. Thank you. Court personnel, I want to thank you for being here and supporting this effort. Thank you. I think we want to thank you all as well. This, this is much needed, and thank you for your foresight to do it. Thanks, sir. <coughs> oh, and our congratulations in order for October. Are you making any announcements? Me? Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, it's been pretty well known around a lot of the courts, That's all the courthouse. <laughs> I'm retiring in six weeks, October 1st. Oh, congratulations. So this will, this will be a... Uh, 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 an addition I will not get to enjoy except as a tax-paying citizen coming back to uh, observe our corpse. Thank you all very much for, uh, for your, your foresight to do this. And we thank you for all your years of service. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Do we want to, at this point to look at 6A or do we want to shelve that until September meeting? We've already done 6A.
original 6A? The original 6A, which is American Rescue Plan allocation. We talked about showing that, we talked about doing it. Is there any preference for this meeting? All right. Then we're going into uh, American Rescue Plan Act allocation and Ms. Crawford. Yes. We'll do that. Good evening. Alamance County has benefited greatly from the American Rescue Plan Act funding, and we are quickly approaching the first of two funding deadlines for the program. As you can see by the first slide, um, per the Federal Treasury Department Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund's final rule, all ARPA funds must be obligated by December 31st of 2024. And as a reminder, the Treasury Department and Uniform Guidance define obligation as an order placed for property and services and in entering into contracts, subawards, and similar transactions that require payment. That means that they are going to formally obligate us to use the funds that we say that we are when we initiate a project for that specific purpose. Uh, you may notice that attachment A to your agenda item shows an updated project budget with our actual expenditures as of August 1st of 24. And so we see that there's a total amount remaining to be spent of just over $10 million. 9.4 of that is unobligated and at this point would have to be returned to the Treasury Department if not obligated by December 31st. Approximately 750,000 uh, remains in that 10 million that we talked about that is already obligated um, on projects previously approved and are in progress. We anticipate that that funding will be fully expended. So tonight, uh, I will be presenting three options for how we can obligate the remaining $9.4 million in ARPA funds um, by December 31st of 2024. We have three options. You may notice that there are some significant changes to the options from what was included in the original agenda packet. Uh, we have had some additional information that we've received since then. I wanted to make sure that we shared as up-to-date information as possible with the most expedient of options. So we'll review each of these three options. Um, all are needed projects that staff have reviewed with you as the board at previous meetings and all are eligible under the Treasury expenditure categories. We will review pros and cons of each of those options and then request at the end a board recommendation for how to move forward with the preferred option. Our first option is for the Behavioral Health Center purchase. And I originally previewed this project, that was fancy, at the February 19th commissioner meeting. Um, this does require the county to find additional funding outside of ARPA and ARPA accrued interest in order to fund the project. But we know that the total cost has decreased by $4 million since we last talked about it in February. And that's due to VIA applying for and being awarded a grant to reduce the total cost. We are now looking at a total cost of $14 million. We have since February accrued additional interest. We are now at 2.7 million in accrued interest. Uh, and so that would lower the amount the originally we talked about for borrowing in order to fund the full project. But at this time, we would recommend not taking on additional debt to fund that last piece because it is such a small amount and instead tapping some of our capital reserve. Uh, due to the existing contract between VIA and the developer, we will be unable to purchase the building until July 2026. With the, if you remember our initial slide, that is well after the Treasury deadline. Uh, we would need to enter into an interagency agreement that is allowable under federal guidelines in order to meet the obligation deadline. So just a quick review from a pro standpoint, we have an eligible expense. We have made a verbal commitment to VIA to purchase the facility, so we want to uphold that commitment. 
And then from a cons perspective, we would need additional funding outside of ARPA, and we would have to enter into an interagency agreement, which would be internal to the county in order to meet that obligation definition and deadline. Next, we have option two, which is similar to what you may have seen in the agenda with one change, and that was originally we recommended that you use part of the funding for a computer-aided dispatch upgrade. Uh, at this point, that project is not to the point where it would be ready to obligate and be expended uh, by the deadline. We also know that the cost continues to fluctuate. And because we want to bring you the most up-to-date, complete information, at this point, we would not recommend using ARPA for that source. We do, however, continue to recommend uh, using 4.8 million of ARPA to do a mobile radio replacement. We brought that to you as a part of our FY25 uh, CIP and originally anticipated using installment funding to support that project. However, if we use ARPA, we would not have to take on that debt. We know that this is an eligible purchase. We know that it is ready to purchase now and actually can be expended prior to our obligation deadline. In addition to the mobile radio replacement, we recommend using the rest of the funding to support emergency services infrastructure, such as generator replacements at the Human Services Center and also at the new emergency services building or the newly purchased, it is not a new building, new to the county. Uh, also HVAC replacements at both of those facilities. Uh, we know that we have four paramedic quick response vehicles that are due for replacement. Um, and then lastly, we know that for EMS and parks, we have many cardiac monitors and defibrillators that are due to be replaced over the next two years. And so these would all be eligible expenses that are ready to be purchased and could be obligated prior to the deadline. If we were to not purchase the diversion center with the ARPA funds, we did want to review what would be the impact uh, we would need to find an alternative funding source if we wanted to uphold that verbal commitment to VIA, which we do. Um, but we do know that opioid settlement funding is an eligible cost. You have approved at the March 18th meeting to use that funding for lease payments, and so we could certainly continue to do that. That funding is in place for at least the next 16 years. Um, and we also know that you recently approved to sign on to the Kroger settlement, so we can anticipate additional funding. Now, this does mean that there is less funding available for, for services in the community if you use it for lease payments, but we anticipate the settlement funds will continue to increase. County general funded maintenance of effort, or MOE dollars, are also eligible for this and could support the additional ongoing lease payments. Lastly, we come to option three. Option three is our newest option. Um, it is by far the fastest option. We continue to recommend that mobile radio replacement be first. That is a project ready to go and is a huge need for the county. What we would say as the difference between option two and option three is that instead of making new purchases, we go back and supplant funds for existing purchases that we have made, which we are allowed to go back to 2021 um, for eligible projects. We have purchased replacement ambulances, um, replacement paramedic or quick response vehicles, remounted ambulances, and then emergency medical services salary and fringe that have not already been supplanted. So these again are all eligible costs. We know that we can do that tomorrow uh, to make that change. And that total cost of that would be about 4.7 million. How would that be distributed on the balance sheet? Uh, it would, just like with the revenue replacement, it would free up county general funds that how were used for the original the purchases. Of, I'm sorry? How much would they go into capital and how much into operations? Uh, it would all go back into the fund balance. Are there any questions before we move into whether you are prepared to recommend an option one, two, or three. Hmm. Oh, can I go? Oh, oh yes. I'll go be real quick. Um, 
I went to the Jack meeting last month mm -hmm. because I, I needed to go. I was hearing a lot of things. And I spoke with VIA representatives mm -hmm. when I was in Winston-Salem last week. And from what I understand, we do not have a security definitely until it's getting right. Whatever we got right now is fixing right. to be gone, and we don't have a security contract. There is no way that place needs to be open without security on the site, okay? And then I don't think we have the pharmacy contract yet. And then I'm told the 16-bed unit is not going to be working for about six months because of licensure. So ARMC is covering exactly what we built this place for. Yeah. <laughs> this is a big. This is a big deal. I, supporting mental health addiction. Good gosh, you can't support enough of it. But that place is built and semi kind of sort of open, and we don't have these these things right here. And I don't understand how we have an open house on June 19th, and then we're not open, open. And the whole thing about this was helping these people go whatever amount of days it would be with that 16-bed unit. We've heard that forever, and it ain't working. And um, the whole, like I said, the whole goal was going across the thresholds of the jail, doing assessments. I mean, it's working like clockwork. RHA was over there behind the mall, and now they're there, and they're not doing everything that we thought we built this for. And it's just the timing. And I wonder, can our General Assembly folks, our register, you know, our Senate and House people, can they help us? Is it something you can help get through quicker? I'm not asking to break the law. Um, I'm just asking, can we have advocacy for that while that building sits over there for six months? And we're looking at $14 million. You know, then I look over here at option three. I'm all about EMS. I'm all about that. I'm watching EMS rebuild ambulances because we've heard how we're short on that. We, you know, we look at the Mevin thing, 16 more staff members, if that's, a, you know, a wish come true. Um, I, I don't, I don't know. I've just got some serious questions about our diversion center is not what it is the big plan to be, and that may be a timing with licensures and all that. But um, I don't recall hearing about a licensure when we've been talking about this building, this whole process and stuff. And I know that's just the way it is. That's government, and it has to be safe and secure, and all this needs to be in place. But it's sitting there. It looks great but we're not able to use it for what we built it for. And I, and I was told at the meeting, because I asked questions, that you can't get that licensure till when you get it built and you're ready to move forward like that. I don't even understand how that works, but I don't make up those rules. Because we need it now, you know? Um, if this is such a dire straight need, and it is, we need it now. Because um, I mentioned you, John, because I know you, you talked about that 16 bed. That is, that is pristine right there. That's a big one. And um, I, I don't know. I just I have questions about that, and I I don't want us to. Well, one of the problems I heard about when we were there, when we were over there, was the issue with the security. I did not hear about the licensure. Yeah, and uh, I heard they had sewage problems. <coughs> so you might heard about that. They had a sewage backup. No, okay. but that happens. Yeah. So sorry, Steve. Uh, now, right now, if they had the licensure, that if a law enforcement person were to deliver, the way I understand. The process, if they were to deliver somebody to the facility, the law enforcement officer would have to remain on site if they did not have on site security. They go to ARMC. Right. So you tie, I, well, that's one of the things I don't understand about the municipalities that they seem to be backing out of trying to help us on this. I mean, they all are part of it. They get yeah. to turn, if we have security there, one officer, they get to walk away. That officer delivers somebody and walks out the door. Was for the whole county, not for the just the whole county. It's not just for the rural parts of the county, and most of the rural parts. I don't, I don't believe most of the rural parts of the county are going to be sending people into this facility. I think it's going to be coming from our municipalities. It seems like to me they ought to be stepping up to try and provide, come to some sort of agreement to provide security backup for our behavioral health center. It may be county, it may be Alamance County Behavioral Health Center, but it's for Burlington, Graham, Mebane, Hall River are all, and Gibsonville, are all parts of Alamance County. 
Well, I've asked Heidi to get Vaya in here as soon as possible so they can tell us the deals. Because if you don't know, you don't know. That's right. Additionally, the center is inside the city of Burlington. So I've had a major issue why Burlington will not step up to the plate. And Burlington's fully, the last time I checked at least, was fully staffed. And then you say that. PD. Well, the point is, it has to have security. Right. I agree. Or, or an officer has to stay in the facility when he brings somebody to it. That's the way I've understood it up to this point. Happy it would, it to. would make sense for an off for the municipal police department to want to be able to have somebody on staff. So, you know, hypothetically, Burlington could have three officers sitting around there with, with somebody within different individuals tied up or Graham or Bevan or whatever. It sounds like you'd like to have Vaya here for a discussion on operations of behavioral health. We can we can do that. Is there anything that you'd need an answer to tonight to help you flush out the decision of whether or not to purchase the behavioral health center? I'm going to suggest that we move this to our September, first September meeting. Uh, have Vaya, Mr. Porterfield here, uh, various individuals, and possibly, particularly, Chief Bailey uh, and our good sheriff Terry Johnson here to answer some of these questions before we decide. Talking about millions of dollars, and I think we don't do not have enough information at this point to make an informed decision. Well, another issue too is we've got we're funding, as I understand it, we're funding through sources that come through us to buy us enough money to pay the lease payments on the facility without us buying it. I know we indicated an interest in wanting to be able to purchase it, but that doesn't mean we have to. That's correct. If we can, if we can take money out of our, that doesn't pass through, we don't, we can't use it any other way but pass it through to VIA and pay for the facility, it would make sense to make that decision at some point in the future if we decide to do so, to make a purchase. We've got the lease purchase option. Mr. Chairman, I have a couple questions to that uh, related to Mr. Carter's questions. Um, so these maintenance of effort monies, this is what we statutorily must pay via to be our element here, right? Correct. And that number is constant. Correct. And right now that number is going to a lease payment for the behavioral health center. It, that is an eligible use of the MRE funds. And if we were to purchase it, we still owe that money to buy it. Right. So they're still getting the money that we're that we're automatically paying. Right. It could be redirected for programs okay. and services yeah. rather than the lease payments. Okay. Um, also, the the purchase price of the facility that the base purchase price is twelve point five million dollars. Right. The fourteen million dollars is for is due to the upgrades that are required at the facility. Um, can you go back to the sure. first one? But as we're making, am I, am I correct that as we're making lease payments, we are buying down the purchase price over the 10-year period of the lease, so that at the end of the 10-year lease, the purchase price is not 14 million but 12.5. Because you pay for all of the upgrades through the lease payments. Yes, that's and correct. So the longer we wait, the less it puts it right. comes if we choose to buy it. Um, so for those reasons, and then it, it, it frees up 9.4 million in ARPA and 2.7 million in ARPA interest to use elsewhere um, and other items. Plus, if we if we buy it, are we? That 1.8 million must come from either financing or capital reserves, thereby further depleting the cap the 10 million that we currently would have in capital reserves by another two million dollars. Right. Yes. I mean, it's fine to put this off, but I mean, I, I'm heavily leaning towards not purchasing this and, and freeing up these arms funds to use also. thereby allowing our capital reserves that we do have to go further, and allowing us to purchase with ARPA cash. Right. Those items which we otherwise would have to purchase with our, our own capital reserves. Needed items. Yep. Okay. 
What is your recommendation? You're the county manager. Well, we weren't sure whether or not the board had a commitment to purchase, so we wanted to kind of feel out the direction from the board. That wasn't our preferred option. I think that either option two or three, I think, is more favorable to our financial situation, particularly the not having to finance the radio system right out of the gate. That helps significantly. And then we have other needs. You can either supplant, which is your option three, and then that frees up some capacity for other uses, or you could make some purchases related to eligible expenses that we currently have many of those in your CIP. So either option two or three, I think, makes, makes All sense. All the two, which is your personal preference? I don't know that we have a preference. They both work. Um, well, how much would that, how much of that uh, available funding that would be freed up by not purchasing the uh, diversion center uh, would be allowable to be used, or could it be applied to cost for the court? None for the court. None for the court. None for the court. We'll make we've, that clear. We've That's given you the list of eligible expenses. It would be either be on the emergency services infrastructure or the supplanting for emergency services. And those are all great needs as well. Yes. And you will likely be paying for those at some point in the future. Right. Out of your general fund. Well, it looks like option three covers needs and more, and you've got the money to do it. Mm -hmm. Can you show option three again? Yeah. Thank you. And, and just one more question. Where I'm looking at option two, use opioid settlement and maintenance of effort, MOE, I understand that. Is that going to pull away from all the services and programs that you're wanting to do for everybody that's basically overdosing in this county? If you're, using, if you're using those for lease payments, you have less capacity for programming. Oh, no. But we do know through the Kroger settlement that we anticipate additional settlement funding will be added. Don't right. count your chickens before the hatch. Is there anything else you're right. you want to add related to behavioral health? No, Karen? I would just say when you're thinking about the opioid settlement monies, just remember that we have to go through a long process of, yeah. of justification for that. So, yes, there will be potentially more money from the Kroger settlement, yeah. but let's don't bank on that right? because we, we still have to justify that. The funds that are reimbursed, Yes. Can any of that be used toward the court building? Yes, as a supplanting piece, that right. money, because you're supplanting funds that you've right. already expended, exactly. that money becomes free and clear. So that's a, another, uh, I can't do math tonight. <laughs> How much money is that? Um, it's just over $4 million. Yeah. Another four, over four million we could use for the court, which would mean five and ten and four, nineteen. I did do that math. <laughs> and is this coming out of the opioid settlement money? Okay. No, it's not. You still have yes. those needs. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't hear you. I didn't hear. I was just saying you would still have the needs that we showed in option two if you right. are going to put everything towards courthouse, right? It becomes sort of a shell game, right? You still have the We needs. always have <laughs> needs, don't we? Yes. But we have really heard about EMS a lot. A lot. And they're like the stepchild. So if you got a chance to really reinforce them and just get them up to par, whatever par is, that's possible, you need to go for it. Mr. Lashley. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just have one question. I just want to verify something you said. If, if, if you're looking at option one, if we, if, we don't, if we don't do option one, will it free up the $1.86 in the capital reserve fund? Yes. So we can go ahead and add that back into the capital reserve and we won't be using that. 
uh, will we, with this option, will we have to use that amount of money on the capital reserve fund going for if we like we get through the end of the finance payments, will we have to use that number to make it happen? Like we're thinking eight years from now. So I think we were planning to make the purchase of 14, and this is showing you how you would come up okay. with that. So if I don't use this option, the capital reserve money goes back into the capital reserve fund, and then we, at a later time, we have to, we'll be making finance, we'll be making rent payments, I'll have to say, on the building going forward with five. Yes. Okay. So let's go to, um, and thank you for your presentation, Rebecca. It was very, very good. Definitely. Uh, Going to option number two, looking at option number two versus option number three. Mm -hmm. now, now, Heidi, you mentioned that we are going to have to pay for these items. In some other way. Some other way. And it may not be... It may not be next fiscal next, year. Right. Some of these are in our CIP. We were just trying to find eligible expenses that we knew of. Right, right. And and this money has to be obligated. By the end of December. December 31st. Correct. Well, that being said, I choose option three. That's my preference, but I'll do option two. I think we have time to figure out our finances as mm -hmm. far as buying Right. By, buying the diversion center. We have time. And I think Craig made a really good point in, in how you laid it out that we got some time before we have to pull the trigger on that. But, like Ms. Thompson said, those are the things that I had heard about the, um, about uh, no security at, at the diversion center. We certainly need to look into that ASAP. It's That's not no security. I think it's limited hours. Limited, it's, limited hours. So right now they have a contract with the sheriff's office to provide 16 hours a day, five days a week. Okay. They, it is my understanding that that contract was supposed to end at the end of August, but that contract is being renewed right now. Okay. That's great. So we actually have some time. I don't know if said that. I didn't interrupt anyone. Uh, so we have some time to talk to Burlington since, like you said, it's in their backyard. Why couldn't we ask Burlington to sort of help us out with this? The ask has been made. And you haven't got a response? So the ask was made of all municipalities. No one just, no one chose to participate. Interesting. And then I think there have been additional ask and, and additional meetings between RHA, the Sheriff's Office, and City of Burlington. Um, and I did not get the update on that before this evening. Maybe they can't do it because they're, you know, they don't have the money because they're putting AstroTurf on recreation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Yeah. I'll pay attention. <laughs> That's all. The question I would have an option to the uh, software update. How critical is that? Um, we don't have the CAD on here as part of what we would use ARPA funds for. Did you want me to talk about the CAD project or that's no longer your option? Is that not part of option two now? That was, yes, that was a revision from the original agenda. Okay. Thank you. It, it was a timing and we're not sure we'll have that project eligible given the timing of needing to commit the funds. All right. I will second Mr. Lashley's motion. What was your motion? Option three. You have to choose option three. <laughs> that was two. That was two. Yeah. Uh, I said between two or three, I would much rather have number three. Uh, and I think it, it actually uh, it, it actually produces a lot more for everyone rather than just option two. Right. But that's that would be my preference. I mean, I could support either. I just know that we could probably... Uh, well, is your motion or not? Uh, if well, it is, I'm going to suck at that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Henry. <laughs> I'll third it. Well, so before you do, yes, sir. Before you do, can I ask one question? Uh, EMS salary in French, what is that? 
So those are existing expenses from FY23-24 for paramedics, EMTs, uh, staff that are in the field responding in the face of COVID. So that reimburses that amount back to the Exactly. Back to the, if you add 4.8 and all those other numbers, does that equal 9.4? So it's $4,601,171 for all of the second section in the emergency services infrastructure. I'm confused. So do the, 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 the 4.8 plus all the other numbers equal the 9.4? That's correct. Okay, okay that's one. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Well, like I said, you can't go wrong. Is your information You can't go wrong with these <laughs> options. You can't that's right. You're right. You're right. So really? I, I would choose option three. That is a motion. Second. Yeah. If it's a motion, <laughs> I'll make a motion that we choose option Well, I've already said I second it, so if you don't want to second it. <laughs> Thank you. Let's go. All right. Let's we have go. two seconds. Go Let's move on to something else. Let's go. We have a vote. <laughs> okay. We motioned. We got a vote. Any further discussion? All in favor of option number three, signify by saying aye. 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 Any yes. opposed? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you didn't know you were going to start a fight, did you? <laughs> <laughs> a good one. <laughs> hey, just a quick question. So those funds become usable for the county training funds? That's correct. Yeah. No, the sure. most flexibility with yeah. option three. Uh, so now we can look at how to better use that money, right? We're now down, down to 6, C, or D, depending on your preference. <laughs> Purchase a resolution authorizing construction management at risk services. Thank you, Board. We're going to talk a little bit about the uh, construction and renovation project for the Emergency Services Center. The staff has recommended that we, can, that we choose a construction management at risk construction delivery method. That's one of the methods available to you in statute. One of the requirements before we choose that method is that we talk about the pros and cons and address any questions that you have related to that. So Deputy County Manager Hope is going to address your questions. All right. Good evening. So I'm just going to talk about construction delivery methods really quick. Um, basically, there are three methods. Um, the first one is design, bid, build. This is the one that we always use. You select an architect. They create a plan you put this out to bid and then a general contractor builds it. The second one is construction manager at risk. This is a little bit different. The architect designs it, but they work with the construction manager from the very start. And um, the, then the construction manager gives a maximum guaranteed price when you're ready to start construction. The last one is a design build. This is just you pick a general contractor, they design and build it. That's usually for projects that are under $10 million. That is um, the, if we get to a MEBIN EMS base, that is a great um, way to deliver that product. So this um, may be a little bit difficult to read, but basically I'm gonna go over the design, bid, build sort of the pros and cons, and then the construction manager at risk. So like I said before, the design build bid, you as the owner select a designer, they do all of the construction documents, you put it out to bid, you get a general contractor, they select their subs, and then the building is built. So this gives you the greatest level of competition because you're putting it out to build. It's the lowest initial cost, and contractually, it's the least complex. Um, the cons of this would be um, the general contractor's qualifications are secondary to price. And we just talked about this a few minutes ago um, when we were talking about taking the lowest bill, bid. Sometimes you are uh, sacrificing quality for that. Um, the general contractor is not on board during design, and you're susceptible to more change orders and disputes through this method. And sometimes the lowest bidder has shortcom shortcomings in their contractor scopes. So if we look at the construction manager at risk, the pros of that, or the way that that work is that the owner would select a designer, which for the BD building, we have already done that. We have gotten to the point where we have sort of a concept 
a conceptual drawing of that. Um, but if we were to select a construction manager at this point, the two of them can work together. So the way that that works is that as they're going through the design and they're saying, okay, we need to, um, we need to harden this building by building these sheer walls, the construction manager is there to say, okay, you don't want to do that out of steel because right now steel prices are way overpriced. There's other options you can build that with. So there's lots of examples of this. This building is very, very complex, very technical. So the pros of that would be that you're selecting your construction manager based on qualifications, not on price. Mm -hmm. the, proje uh, the project financials are open. Once you get your construction manager on board, they're there to, during the design part. They review um, the design and cost estimating. And then once the design is ready, then they put it out for a competitive bid. And they put it out for your subcontractors and they bid with multiple subcontractors. So they also can offer better, sometimes better um, schedule management. So the cons to this is that it, would, it could be a higher initial cost than design bid build, but hopefully at the end of the project, you don't have as many change orders and so your cost is going to be about the same. Um, and then this is the type of uh, construction delivery method that's used when the project is over $10 million. So that's just a little bit about the uh, two types of delivery methods. And again, this, this project is extremely complicated, extremely technical. There are a lot of advantages to have you, having a construction manager already in place and working with your design team. And so what we're asking tonight is for the commissioners to allow us to move towards utilizing a construction manager at risk. Questions? I might indicate having practiced law literally for 50 years, I've seen so many lawsuits, including the one over at Alamance County Jail, where we did not have anybody overseeing the project. And you then have manufacturers, no, it's not me. The construction company saying, no, it's not me. It's the whatever. There's a window commercial on right now that goes into that. <laughs> Pretty good example that I've been involved with with clients lawsuits over not having anybody with the expertise over. So therefore, I'm encouraging us to do the construction manager at this option. These are going to keep us out of a lot of trouble. Do we have a number as to the difference in costs? I do not have a number as, in, as to the difference in cost. We still have a budget that we're working within. And so that construction manager would be aware of that budget after we select on qualifications. Well, in a rising, a rising uh, cost environment, too, that locks in your cost at the front end. The construction manager at risk literally is at risk if it goes over. We saw that with Southeast. We had an amount, and if it went over, they ate it. Mm -hmm. I think Southern Elements, too, because it was such a big job. So I, I think it's smart. You've got to cover your bases. The problem is the price is so high to begin with yeah. that there ain't no risk. I've been in that business for my entire <laughs> career. There is no risk for CMs. Any other county commissioner comments <clears throat> or questions? Is there an incentive for the construction manager who has to come out of the gates so high to cover all contingencies that cost actually is significant? That is. And, and like I said, we would select based on qualifications, but they would know what our budget is after that's selected. So they would know that we can't go way beyond a certain price. And they'd have to decide if they can work within that or not. But yes, you're right. It is usually the, the price is higher, 
but also at the end, you don't hopefully have as many change orders so that the price is going to hopefully level out. This building's already built. Right? Yes. So, uh, I mean, is it, is it most of the work that is designed to, to deal with all of the electronics and all of the computer terminals? I mean, isn't, isn't that sort of the greatest work? So you're talking about the infrastructure is a great part of the cost, right. but also this hardening of this building is a great part of the cost as well. So yes, the infrastructure is extremely expensive, but you're talking about building a 911 center and that in of itself is expensive too. So it's not just about the technology piece of it or the infrastructure. It's also about we have to harden that building too. And under both of these, are we providing the specifications, or is the construction manager and the construction manager and the rest providing the specifications? So we well, are. Actually, federally mandated, particularly with the hardening. Yeah. So we are saying what we want, and they are figuring out how to get us there. So the architect and the construction manager would be figuring out how do we get us there. It, it's a different model than what we've normally used as a county, but the school system has used it, ACC used it. Um, it's, it's not unusual, it's just different for us. Does anybody part of this is uh, all the doors, all the windows, everything has to be hardened uh, to the impact. We're not going to have an invasion, we're not going to have uh, all kinds of things that could otherwise happen to a normal building, and that's federally and state mandated, mostly federal uh, mandates, but additionally, we are not building the additional building that Burlington wanted us to build, because nobody in the current, this time frame, builds an additional building for servers. Uh, everything's done in the cloud, I've talked to many, many, many experts, and when I start talking about building an additional building for servers, they all start laughing and say, have you considered? Uh, so I'm not sure what Burlington was talking about. I think they just wanted it, wanted it out so they could control their own. Uh, but yeah, nobody in this day and time talks about an additional building for backup servers. Just, just, just not done. Last quick question on design building. You're not just selecting the lowest price, but the lowest uh, responsible? Responsible That's price, lowest yeah. Lowest responsible, mm -hmm. meaning that the, the, the general contractor is responsible to do the work at, at that price. Um, it's meaning that, but it's also meaning you can look to see have they done similar pro have they done similar product projects, but the price is really the driver. Has anybody from the county been to Randolph County to see theirs? I had a meeting down there, and Daryl Fry um, took me in theirs, and. Um, it's not massively big, it's just screen, 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 but mm -hmm. I would suggest y'all go look at that. So I think that was one of the facilities that was visited when we first started mm -hmm. talking about a new 911 center. Yeah. Sherry, how many people normally throw in their hat on these bids? Because is it is it separated by, I have a construction manager and he's going to be the project manager of the whole entire project? Or do you just have people who say, okay, I'll do the work, and then they do a subcontract to that? Like, I, mean, I guess what I'm asking is, like, how many people would, as a construction manager company, how many companies would you get to? I don't know the number of that. I would say it's probably the really, really large companies yeah. around here are the ones that are going to do the construction manager at risk. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't know. To, to me, construction manager at risk might be a little overkill on, on this one. I mean, I know the school system has done them for big projects. Yeah. I think we should consider that courthouse for this. I think it's smaller. I'm happy to design up and a little bit more competition. 
as well. I'm going to make a motion that we uh, opt for the construction construction manager at risk option. Anybody want to second? There's no second, it doesn't apply. I guess we have no motion. Right. Can we make a motion to do the other one? Or is it just sure, a, is oh, we'll, we'll go we'll go to that will be the option if we don't do construction manager at risk. We'll go to design bid build. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Stevens. Thank you, board. Um, as you all know, I've been on an ongoing quest to update our ordinances to make sure we're in compliance and up to date related to statute. We had the emergency uh, a week or so ago related to Debbie and needed to declare a state of emergency. We have an ordinance in place currently that allowed for that to happen. It was last updated in 1987 and made reference to several statutes that have been repealed in the interim. So um, the draft you see in front of you today is actually just an update of that. Uh, the board can meet to declare a state of emergency, but most boards do, and this board has given that authority to the board chair in order to avoid the need for a board to try to meet in haste based on an emergency that's how ongoing in the county. So that's currently where we are in terms of what our ordinance allows, and this is drafted merely to update the statutory references in that and no other critical changes. Are you sure we're not rushing this since it was 1987? <laughs> well, I know I, how we like to take our time. Yeah, I think two decades is probably okay. enough. Yeah. You say so. What happened uh, during the last emergency, which we declared, what, two weeks ago? That's right. Uh, I got a telephone call from, our, from Miss York and from our emergency uh, folks and so forth. We as county commissioners, receive weather updates on a regular basis and emergency updates. Uh, so instead of, uh, that was, I've gotten in the morning, uh, we declared the emergency that afternoon because it was coming in quickly. Um, and so instead of calling everybody in for a formal meeting, I was able under our current guidelines to sign the emergency declaration. So I got myself down here and signed it. Um, and you guys were not bothered with that. And then uh, to terminate it, I signed the document to terminate it. It simply means you appoint somewhere one that can do it in an emergency. That's correct. And avoids the need to try to hold an emergency meeting under adverse circumstances. Um, the states of emergency allow for us to activate mutual aid agreements uh, to receive aid from the state, uh, can affect FEMA reimbursements for the expenditures that we have. So that's pretty much why we want to do it. Uh, again, nothing about this changes the status quo, it just brings things up to date in terms of what statutes it makes reference to. Right. Did you declare emergency before the county, before or after your emergency at your house? Uh, the, tree your house out. <laughs> the, the tree hit my house before I declared the emergency. Should have went on and declared it then, buddy. <laughs> the FEMA could have come over there and nipped it in the bud. Right. Yeah. Well, I don't think FEMA or anybody else cared about me other than the church care. <laughs> Mr. Chair, that helps us farmers too because when you do declare this, if there's aid that will come to farmers, if Alamance County doesn't declare that emergency, we don't qualify. And that's we've exactly. had that happen in the past. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. Motion Good. to approve. Second. And mm -hmm. motion second. Any other comments? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I got a lot of questions. <laughs> then, and we're just getting Mr. started. Mr. Carter's at the end. asking for recess. Sounds like Mr. Lashley is. So well, I'll go quick. I only got like maybe four or five. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, oh, you, quarterly you report. Oh, you negotiated, Mr. Okay. Carter. <laughs> yeah. 
You need, you need to. Uh, I need a short reset. Yeah, I'm going to take a five minute reset. County attorney? I think it's the county manager. County manager. Finance manager. Finance manager. County manager first. But it says okay. seven county attorneys I'm sorry, attorney. report. I'm, sorry. I'm looking, oh, I'm looking yeah. at Susan Evans. Do you have the report? I'll be quick. I don't have a whole lot. Oh. I don't have a whole lot to say. You guys have heard from me tonight already. I just <laughs> want to say thank you. My pleasure to be your attorney, and that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you Can happy to be on the finances? I am. <laughs> I'm going to keep the same thing. <laughs> there you go. County manager. The only thing that I have on there is your fourth quarter financial report. It's the closing of fiscal year 24. It is unaudited. We're still working on an audit, so those numbers will be finalized once we get the audit back in November. Yeah. Are there questions? See, about you already had, you already answered one of my questions. Very good. When's the audit going to be done? It'll be done in November. So November. That's one. End of November. So now I just got 121 to go. All right. <laughs> I'm just. <kidding. laughs> Does I want to start. Anybody want to make a motion to adjourn before? <laughs> <laughs> this is his thing. Second. Let him ask. Yeah, we're all out of here. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be very quick. I, I just have a couple of things I wanted to ask. And it, okay, first, you said this is end of 24. We don't have any more things coming in. So this is unaudited, like, meaning that this does not have our accruals, so any revenue that's coming back into fiscal year 24 or expenditures that we are moving back into 24. Okay. So it's unaudited. These are not the final numbers. They're not the final numbers. Not the final. Because I was focusing on number two, the sales tax revenue yes. collections. Yeah. Uh, just wanted because that's a bit different than the number that I have, but yes. it's not... This stuff. does not have those two months of accruals in it. So chances are we're not going to be 4.4 percent lower. That's correct. See, you guys are making this way too easy. <laughs> uh, the uh, next thing I wanted to talk about was the. Um, uh, I'm just going to skip down to number 13. Okay. Now I'll, I'll come back up. Uh, I see a ABSS school system local funding revenues to date. I see that the, they have uh, a difference of 128799 Is that their fund balance? So, again, these numbers are not final for the school system either. They will have accruals that they will be moving back into fiscal year 24 as well. Um, but at the time of this report, it would be showing that they would be adding $128,000 to their fund balance. To their fund balance. Well, their, their fund balance, I was under the assumption that that about what they have in the fund balance. Yes, that's what I saw. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, the, uh, the, the, the thing that I just wanted to focus on is uh, number six. I think this is in your wheelhouse. Uh, ARP funds of 32925000 and change have earned $2.6 million this year. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Excellent work. Very, very nice. Um, and you're now still we'll say that is through from the inception when we received those first deposits. Okay. So yes. And I see that the ARP expenditures are uh, encumbrance through June 2024 of 29.7. Mm -hmm. It's good work. I mean, I just want to applaud you for that because I know that when we first started down this road four years ago, uh, we were doing, we were getting like point twos and point fives. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Thank you. Have a seat. I knew Bruce was up to oh something. Oh my gosh! Did he have anything to do with it? That's priceless. <laughs> okay, I got the hint. Let's go. That's too funny. <laughs> Interest rates have, have greatly increased. Well, that was because my my last question. Uh, are you um, like the like <laughs> next month? Federal Reserve is going to start cutting rates, and I'm sure it's going to affect your corporate paper. Are you going to go ahead and try to see if you can ink a deal before then? Oh, uh, so. Luckily, this is a good timing of the year in that we are starting to see that first wave of tax revenue coming in. Mm -hmm. So as the cash flows come in, this is the time that we do start our investing. A portion of that um, I submit to the capital trust, which they are able to invest in treasuries and things of that nature, keep the liquidity, 
um, but it's a very competitive rate. Mm -hmm. Commercial papers are paying slightly higher than that, but by locking in at those higher rates now and going for a nine-month term, okay. when those interest rates do start coming down, we will still see the profits sure. of the um, higher interest rates. And you rate. said the term is mostly nine months? Nine months is about as far out as I go with the commercial papers. Mm -hmm. Um, agencies, you can get out a little bit further, but our policy locks us in for no more than three years from the maturity date. That's what I was going to ask. Is there any way you can mm -hmm. go out further, so maybe maybe 24 to 36 months, mm -hmm. just to, because rates are going to dip down a little bit in the next 24 months. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Yeah. And if our if our labor rate continues to tick higher, it could drift higher. Interest right. rates could, could come down even further. All right, I'm done, guys. Make a motion to go home. Well, <laughs> actually, we now go to County Commissioner comments. I've already made my comments. Yeah, I asked permission to read um, a text, uh, something someone sent to me. It was about Parks and Rec, and I, I, I want to honor it. I got permission from the lawyer who's so happy to be here. <laughs> so um, um, it said, I would like to address a concern that has recently been communicated to the parents of North Alamance Athletics as well as other programs in the county. I think we've all kind of solved it. I still out of respect. It appears that the Alamance County Recreation Department have made changes to the athletic programming without input from the community and or athletic programs that have been in existence for many years. These programs provide a high quality competitive sports environment. This message has been received, alters a current sports offering and removes competitive sports from the agenda. Currently, Northern Alamance Athletic sponsors competitive to football, basketball, and baseball slash softball are all hopeful there will be opportunities to offer more sports in line with the high school athletics program. The communicative message from the Recreation Department is that competitive sports will be limited and programs such as wiffle ball, kickball, basketball skills, etc. will soon take the space and there will not be an opportunity for the traditional sports to exist. It appears the Recreation Department is transitioning their focus to leisure sports and skills we all learned in elementary and middle school physical education programs. Competitive sports are an important part of growing up. As children move up the school, uh, through the grade levels at schools, they find themselves involved with competitive sports at the middle school level. And uh, individuals that have been involved at younger ages tend to be better prepared as well as better players. And act as active parents and coaches in Northern Alamance Athletics, there are a lot of questions and concerns that need to be addressed. Northern Alamance uses the fields at AO Elementary and has for many years. If the county is looking to expand offerings, why is it necessary to abandon current programs and remove access from the fields that historically offer these competitive sports? The facilities at AO have two baseball fields, one that meets the basic requirements for a competitive baseball field and one that is smaller, but would be an excellent field for wiffle ball and kickball. With communication, one would think both could exist, although there is only a single gym. The recreational department has or can gain access to numerous other fields and gyms through the school system throughout the county. Why tamper with the established programs in the community that are successful and not attempt to establish these leisure time recreational programs in these areas? Did or will the recreation department be surveying the communities to establish baseball numbers and commitments for these sports? I am sure there will be many more questions or concerns regarding this matter. I would appreciate a sit at the table or a representation from Northern Alamance Athletics to discuss the future of sports in Alamance County moving forward and how we can best serve all the children in our county. In our county. And I'm, I just, I think it's a great thing when people really come here. Um, public comment has got a lot of power because it gives you the press, it gives you live stream, and it gives you us. And we always need to be open to, living, to listening to that. And, um, and, I, and one other thing, I had mentioned to Heidi the other day, I asked her where, whenever we used to do the um, Alamance County Government Citizens Academy. I did that. It's fascinating. Love landfill. Buzzards and <laughs> pigeons, are, they don't fly on the same day. See, because they, they, they can work it out. I don't know why we can't, like in Congress. So anyway, um, I had asked Heidi about possibly considering um, the next Government Academy for Citizens for our civics classes in high school. Because I think it's so important that this this age understands what it takes to make everything work. It just doesn't happen. Like you don't turn on a light switch, and it just always comes on. So I had mentioned that to her, um, and I think that's be another great collaboration for us in ABSS. I know there's um, a lot of kids don't know anything, you know, and it's it's the history of this country is so important, so we don't make the same mistakes. So um, I don't know if you ask. Um, I'll see them next week at the school system meeting, and I just think it's so important that we offer that um, and pull. You know, Jeff Smythe used to tell me he would like to have a, 
Citizens Academy for the police for young high schoolers because police were having such a bad time. Sheriff as well, and really the younger you start looking at recruiting folks, the sooner you'll get that built back up. So um, that's just something I had wanted to mention. So that was it. Mr. Turner. I left it all in the field. <laughs> Ditto. I just want to say, I echo what Ms. Thompson just said. Uh, I have said for years, and in fact, we had civics when I was in high school, and we actually went to court. We uh, met with some uh, county and city officials, uh, and so forth. I really will encourage, encourage the ABSS to have civics, maybe required classes. Uh, there's nobody out there in any position that doesn't have any interest in their future, therefore government. Uh, I just really want ABSS to require civics classes. Back when back when dinosaurs were on Yeah. Back when dinosaurs were on the earth, it was required, right? But still is, sir. For us. Problem solved. And I'll give a plug to Curry Bryan, who's the principal at Williams. He was Natalie and Sophie's civics teacher. And he was phenomenal. He's a great principal, too. But um, I just hope that we can, our system and the school system can really collaborate on something like this. We all learn from it. We have a motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> second. Well, we already had about four of those, John. Yeah. <laughs> and Bruce, he gave second. He, he chimed in. <laughs> You've got to admit that. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgov.com tvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.